Hello everyone! Today we talk about Byzantine naval tactics during the early Middle Ages. Um, time span roughly 500-1000 AD, so um, really a based, uh, based time, but um, and, and this is one of the first elements we have to take into consideration. We know a very, very few about uh, naval warfare in the first place, also about much uh, else of maritime uh, let's say of navigation, uh, naval techniques, etc. Um, and this is really the greatest obstacle even in trying to understand how naval warfare uh, actually worked at the time. Um, paradoxically, um, naturally you know that the Mediterranean had this, uh, you know, quite ancient uh, naval uh, tradition that remained really for most of the Middle Ages the most advanced out there. Uh, but it's interesting because the tactics uh, of these times um, and spaces are actually comparable for the greatest part of, of medieval times, even uh, in the northern seas, and and because uh, as always we try to to differentiate, but things were a bit more homogeneous, way more homogeneous actually than we tend to think. And once you've got the, those essentials, everything is is kind of easier. In fact, today we will talk chiefly about the Byzantine navy. We will stick to Byzantine sources uh, chiefly and observe uh, and stay focused on it, but. Um, if you look even at the uh, naval warfare of other peoples, you realize that more or less the tactics were similar, right? The Byzantines had definitely some of the best naval technologies out there. Uh, the major enemies uh, at the time uh, of this period were definitely uh, the Muslim uh, fleets and the Muslim navies that um, were, in this sense, very, very similar actually to the Byzantines ones. For, for one fundamental reason is that the Arabs started to, to go at sea actually with Byzantine crews and ships, just like actually many other navies out there, like it had been in the case of, of, the, case of the Vandals, for instance, Vandal Africa um, had, had begun. And we should uh, uh, give a bit of background, I believe, also to... Uh, of, of, of mm, let's say naval warfare in late antique because uh, it's even difficult to to draw a pretty uh, sharp line between the two ages. Uh, you know that in the ancient world had seen the development of these major, very big uh, ships that were chiefly um, aimed at uh, ramming the enemy ships and sinking them by uh, simply. Um, piercing the the uh, the, the hull, uh, etc. Towards the, um, and and this, okay, we should need further background on ancient um, you know uh, naval warfare, but we we don't. Generally speaking, we, however, we we say that naval warfare was a, a very secondary type of warfare um, compared. Uh, to, to the land one, of course, and this is true also in the Middle Ages, but it, it was also something barely, uh, very rarely um, uh, practiced in general. I mean, if you look at the ancient world, okay, I don't know, Roman warfare, you see how many times the Romans actually used f war fleets to, you know, to, to actually fight and, and in, uh, being engaged into that, into naval um, battles, it, it, it was something pretty rare, right? And there are many reasons that we will try to explain now, along, uh, chiefly talking about the Byzantines specifically, because this video is, is on tactics definitely, but also it, it, we will necessarily take into consideration some strategy as well, and general uh, navigational techniques to understand what this was all about. Uh, de facto. So uh, the, the biggest change had seemingly occurred into the 3rd century. The 3rd century, the Roman Empire, at this point the Roman Empire controls the, the whole Mediterranean. So very different situation from the one we will be seeing today because you know that from the, uh, the, the mid-7th century the Muslim um, and navies fundamentally will uh, break the uh, political unity of the Mediterranean. From one side we have the Christians, the other side the Muslims. This doesn't actually bring to any major differentiation of, uh, of naval warfare at all. On the contrary, um, let's say it, um, it, it made the system evolve further. And this evolution had actually started uh, much before. During the 3rd century, 
um, you know that the empire undergoes this um, major of, of crisis, let's say military crisis at the frontiers that we, we most of all conceive as land frontiers. But actually, in late antique times, one thing that is uh, recovered after um, that is revived that, that uh, emerges once again, seemingly out of the blue, is piracy, which had not existed anymore. I mean, after uh, that Pompey and Caesar had slaughtered uh, the major the Cilician pirates, etc., the Mediterranean had known no piracy, of uh, virtually no mm, uh, pir mm, you know, activity in this sense, uh, because when there is a big power that is solid and, and, and doesn't ad admit this kind of, um, uh, of turbulences, Everybody stays uh, where it is. Of course, there, there there was surely some form of piracy out there. People going like there were brigands, but on land were definitely also on, on sea. But but what happens from the third century onwards is that the all these, especially also the Germanic peoples that we think of them chiefly as uh, terrestrial powers, actually take the sea. It's as if it had been a Viking age antelitum, right? Uh, we know that the Franks, uh, the Goths. Uh, then the Anglo-Saxons, thinking about the uh, Litus Saxonicum in, in, in Britain, um, the, take the sea and, and start uh, harassing the uh, Roman coasts and posing a quite of a substantial uh, strategical threat, uh, uh, let's say at least to the uh, economical floridity that, um, uh, of the Mediterranean, which was what the, the, the World Roman Empire was, was based on fundamentally because that was really the sap of what made the empire strong where they drew uh, the major resources etc. So uh, piracy remains piracy as long as there is no uh, actual power that is able to, to, to build and to maintain ships uh, there is no one who is able to threaten the Roman um, domination of the Mediterranean. The first ones we will get to that will be the Arabs because the Arabs uh, basically occupy these uh, larger chunks of empire that had been lost, so they inherit all this title, um, the, the military and the, the production system there, and they're able to, to found a new new powers on their own that are centralized and therefore can have fleets, etc. Also in here, there was no real permanent fleet. Fleets were uh, let's say it costed a lot to, to mount a naval expedition, but exactly for this reason uh, it wasn't done very often, but it, it was relatively quick in, in terms of what kind of deterrence you could pose on the long run. So um, what you see for most of, of medieval times is that no power had actually anything like a permanent navy, like as much as they didn't have a permanent army on land. Um, what happens in the third century, though, and that you can see both on land and on sea, is that these major fleets that were recruited every once in a while for a situation of emergency, etc., aside from the ones that patrolled, for instance, the, the, the river borders, for instance, uh, there were fleets in the Danube, uh, in the Rhine, uh, even in, on the Euphrates River. Um, and it, it, they start to, uh, to be split into two smaller groups. So uh, uh, this wasn't really um, due to a major, to create a major speed. I mean, this is true on land because the so-called vexillaciones are revived at this point seemingly for increasing, and debatably actually, because this is not enormously clear, for um, getting more speedy, having this kind of mounted contingents, etc. On, on water, it's it's very different because uh, only a land lumber would uh, believe that a smaller ship is is faster than a bigger one. It's obviously the contrary. So the strategical reason for this, um, let's say, uh, actual revival of of naval activities and this uh, split into um, into smaller uh, fleets, let's say, or that were more um, uh, let's say even uh, we in this split obviously corresponded also to a kind of a strategical a repartition of you know of, of certain resources that were used to to produce uh, f um, to to build ships uh, in lock on certain specific ports that increase in importance etc. Exactly for that um, is aimed at having this combat ready force or at least this most immediate uh, ability to to mount up a military expedition that is based locally and therefore it's not a huge uh, fleet like, I don't know, the one that was assembled um, by Antony from Egypt or uh, an Octavian 
in, in Italy that for this major clash, etc., of, of Axiom, and so on. These were ships that had a kind of a, a smaller range, relatively, it's very relative because actually some of them went bank and forth around the Mediterranean. But this corresponds any, anyhow to different strateg strategical needs. Smaller ships generally that cost less, they are more agile. And, and, and looking at the Dromon, that is the type of uh, this galley that, 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 that is type that is developed during. From, from in, in this period, from early medieval times, the sixth century, you realize that there is a general, kind of a general improvement on of the individual vessel's um, speed, um, um, agility. Um, Dromans essentially have this uh, ability to also with, with Latin sails to 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 hold better the wind, uh, and therefore are kind of more they they're evidently aimed at gaining this greater uh, flexibility right uh, and and to be uh, employed much more easily than a, a, a big encumbrant um, uh, ancient galley with this massive um, uh, in the, the, you know uh, volume uh, volume and mass etc it was aimed at chiefly at ramming and it, who was there to ram Honestly, no one, because the ships that were used by these other pirates were smaller. So, the best thing you can, you could do is to uh, to uh, let's say settle on that same level of of dimension to really go after them, chasing them uh, and defeating them. And and this entail this is this was a very long process, by the way. We don't know exactly what the Droman. Um, was uh, was like this was usually a beer aim that eventually evolved this galley is evolving even in triremes etc uh, but from the sources we don't really know uh, you know and we understand at least that there was a, a wider variety there was also the Kelandon that was this seemingly even more uh, you know narrower and smaller and more agile uh, vessel, etc. So th there was even there naturally a tactical differentiation. It was still the big flagship that had to have that mass, the d d um, imposant uh, dimensions, etc. But everything was very, very different from uh, just a very a uh, couple of centuries uh, before. And uh, and there is pro this is a very uh, still a very uh, yet to be explored. Uh, field um, because we up to the 11th century we we have a a very and even afterwards the only truth for the Byzantines specifically a very um, a very shorted a big shortage of of, of 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 sources of data we don't really know and and this unfortunately is what old mm, early medieval warfare is about that sometimes we say oh well this thing didn't exist uh, because uh, the sources didn't show, but how many sources do you have? A very few. Well, then maybe, you know, th there is this kind of attitude you should always have in your mind. Also, because what happens um, from the 11th century onwards is is amazing, um, and it, it it tells us that that something in the meanwhile had happened before, because by the 11th century you have this massive um, Italian galleys that of the, the the maritime republics that start. Now destroying both the Arabs and the Byzantine fleets, and and, and 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 those are things that you could not create from one day to another. The Italian maritime republics also evolved from this broader Byzantine orbit. Especially the first ones were um, think about Venice. Even just uh, today, we will partially talk about that because it was a, there were chunks of the empire where maritime city states in. in in, in contact with the, with the empire and cooperating with the empire later now taking over and even uh, invading the empire also with their economical strength even before their their strictly military one that of course however are still uh, strictly strictly related so you understand that you don't create a naval tradition like that uh, out of the blue and I discuss of this stuff uh, on uh, those videos I made on uh, the Saracens uh, especially, uh, I don't remember what the title was like, something like Reconsidering the Sars and something like that. It tells you that uh, there was a lot going on, especially in centuries like the Tent, etc., that are usually conceived as this. That the word, by the way, that the, the moment of the second invasions, both in the Mediterranean with the Saracens um, and in the, in the North Sea with the Vikings, where you realize that. Um, Something was on in terms that that this weren't quite just disastrous events of 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 new peoples com coming to hammer now what what was left of the Carolingian Empire, 
but something that now was engaging the same local communities when you look at the Saracens uh, those were those weren't just Muslims or coming from from North Africa those the, the were uh, Spanish, Italians, Greeks in there. Um, if you study Byzantine literature on those things, um, you realize that it was very, very difficult to say who was who. I mean, what was who in terms of Byzantine piracy and uh, Islamic piracy? It's it's a very difficult question to answer. Most of the times, the crews were mixed. So, and it turns out that by the 11th century, you have this major revival that couldn't have born, been born from a day to another, where the day before there were just these terrible pirates hammering everywhere and destroying and, and, and pillaging, etc. And, and then the day after you have those regions that were allegedly the most uh, hit by this scourge to produce such a strong military power. They were obviously part of the whole thing. Um, and, uh, and this is a very interesting perspective that I believe in, in, in some decade there will be very interesting monographies written about because it, it's so evident and um, but at the same time in pop culture it's very difficult still to eradicate this stereotype of the uh, of uh, you know, the atomic bomb posed by the, the Vikings and the Saracens and then their distractions more than else. Um, because of a lot of reasons that are sometimes ideological, which doesn't mean to, to deny what was going on, but you have to, in terms of distractions and slaughters, etc., but you have to understand who was doing that, with which resources, where they came from, and, and who was cooperating with them. This is true both in Mediterranean, in the North Sea, everywhere. Um, and even in Black Sea, if you think about the the Rus that were coming from from there, also to 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 harass the, the, the same Byzantine, the same Byzantine world, and um, yeah. So uh, talking finally about this tactics and stuff, um, uh, we we have to realize, as we were saying before, on a very few uh, scanty material. First of all, looking chiefly at the Byzantine. Um, perspective, you have to think the Byzantines were very traditionalist, uh, renowningly, and they were very attached and, um, and, and uh, let's say, uh, naturally tied to the uh, classical sources, both the Greek and the Roman ones. Therefore, there are many terms, you know, that the Byzantines were famous for writing also a lot of military treatises. When we read these treatises, some of them are actually, well, they are actually fantastic. Uh, there is a great... Um, in spite of the general um, historiographical tradition set in the, of the, by the treatise in its forms and, and, and contents, etc., there was still a relative uh, heterogeneity. Um, but um, it, and, and it's difficult sometimes to tell what is true from what is false because you you don't understand whether what was said in there was just or it was just inspired or applying to a classical model. Um, which is typical of Byzantine tradition, or whether they were, they were telling the truth. And we have um, a couple of sources that essentially talk in detail about um, military tactics. When in terms of maneuvering, there, there is an anonymous, an anonymous work um, uh, dated, I think this was to, uh, I think, the, the, the 9th century, possibly, um, that uh, tell, and that's late, yes, because also this is kind of the Macedonian uh, times, right, so the the idea is um, that that also in, in the Empire that there are these kind of different stages of, of, of even of historiographical revival that are very distantiated uh, among the centuries given what has survived to us, uh, for um, at least, that talks about this maneuvering, right, and uses very, you know, very technical terms that are still generic, like sailing past, sailing through to outflank, um, uh, going to the mists, uh, or uh, encircling the enemy, etc. And these are all um, words, like, I won't be repeating, well, well, maybe in Greek, like uh, periplos, uh, paraplos, um, dikaplos, uh, uh, uperkeras, uh, Kuklikon, etc., that are all um, terms deriving from uh, authors like Herodotus, Xenophon, Thucydides, etc. So looking at, um, obviously, at ancient ancient war, uh, ancient naval warfare, and uh, that were, by the way, the thing about the Greek navies at this point, we're still kind of some some sort of pride of, of the Byzantine memory and legacy. 
uh, in, in the Navy. And the um, there are these are very physiological problems more than else. They don't give us particularly you know specific ideas. I obviously tell us that there were this time of maneuvers elsewhere uh, in, in here that were obviously used in all naval warfare existing. Uh, the most interesting source, however, um, is actually the anonymous source is is from the 10th century. Excuse me, not, it was not the night. Oh, thinking end of the night, but it's from the 10th century. The actually the most interesting work in here is the Naumachica of Leo the Sixth, Leo the Wise, um, Byzantine Emperor, and it's paraphrased by Nicephorus Uranus. Right, so here um, he tells us a lot of interesting things. We can't really figure out how you know real they were. Some sound you know kind of normal, interesting. This um, these positions are very uh, simple in general. Uh, some of them are more complicated, and that's where you start to think whether it was just a a literary topos is something that was invented like there, where it was something practical, because some of them are very even difficult to, to see applicable, to see re replicated in, into into reality. Um, so uh, the uh, this time looking at general tactics, the, the the main characteristics of the ships had become that first of all ships were smaller. Secondly, they had abandoned the ramming maneuver, or better the ramming was still there, but it was done with a spore. So uh, this this uh, spore above sea level that was uh, aimed not at crushing the uh, the hull, but the um, the oars, the the cordage, etc. So to to uh, hamper the enemy mobility uh, in that way, not sinking. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, the disappearance of the ram had basically eliminated. Um, any uh, possibility to take out in one shot an enemy ship. This will be uh, revived just with the invention of firearms um, and uh, in naval warfare explosive projectiles uh, appear immediately. I mean as long as there, there, there are guns around, there are explosive shells that can um, can uh, blow up, uh, let's say, at least to cause uh, substantial damage to, to destroy a ship. So uh, in other, way, in, in other words, ta having taken away the ram, there was no other weapon that could sink a ship in one, uh, in one hit, right? So, the um, the other major uh, uh, weapon that was used at this time, and it was a jealous prerogative of the Byzantines, albeit it was actually probably used also by the Arabs, or at least it was something that could be, you know, it was employed um, in in it was employable in practice very easily, also because it, and we're talking about the so-called Greek fire that Byzantines actually called the liquid fire because it's it's basically shot with this substance that gets on fire and also flows above water, so has this ability of of keep being to burn into water. Um, and but the same Byzantines basically took this um, you know the 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 ingredients that are still kind of officially <laughs> I mean not truly really officially Nobody has ever explicitated what they were, but we kind of have an idea that there was a part of naphtha, sulfur, and other kind of resins and stuff like that. We will get more in detail to that at one point on Schwerpunkt. But uh, the crude oil, for example, it was needed for producing this stuff was uh, extracted from the Mesopotamian uh, uh, wells, let's say, in, in, that were held by the, 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 the Abbasids at that time. So, um, this general knowledge of uh, incendiary stuff, etc., is it was probably something that existed beyond the Byzantine world. However, the Byzantines were pretty ingenious and they had invented this ability, these systems to to project Greek fire against, or say better, liquid fire against uh, the enemy, right? And um, and this was a true ship killer uh, indeed because as you imagine you know the material of the ships were all flammable at the time, and or at least all, all almost all of them, did. and the uh, and and let's say that battle tactics were pretty aware of this. Um, however, there is much debate on how the liquid fire was effectively used. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in fact, we're pretty uncertain about how often and in and, and, and which one the, these, the, these circumstances actually were, because um, Byzantine chroniclers actually uh, often att attribute um, uh, victories to the use of liquid fire. However, very rarely they do it when fleets were, were defeated. So it was a way to say, you know, is is this really part of the fight of on how the victory was really achieved, um, and the um, and and there are a few examples of this. There is the uh, the scattered Umayyad, um, um, you know, the 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 scattering of the Umayyad uh, fleet in front of Constantinople in 672, 78, uh, at the hands of uh, Greek fire uh, at Kalinikos, and the um, the fleet sent to Africa under the um, Patras John was unable to resist uh, naval forces sent from Egypt and uh, he had to abandon courage and the and, and the, there is um, other occasions uh, in which liquid fire was used even by a defeated force that is actually the one of um, the um, si, uh, si bur, uh, say, say in Greek, uh, ki bura yota, I should be, um, team that had um, uh, rebelled to the empire. The the, the, the Siberia yota came, um, a fle um, excuse me, team was um, this region of of Lycia, roughly in the south of today's uh, uh, Turkey, and uh, this had sided with the uh, fleet uh, of Thomas the Slav. And, and joining with them, and we know that this Byzantine rebels had um, a Greek fire in that um, situation. And as many of you already know, uh, this uh, liquid fire was um, seemingly thrown with a system that is also acknowledged kind of later, uh, the so-called siphon, right, that could uh, propel the uh, liquid like uh, a pump there was a system to to basically to spurt this at distance and 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 you realize that already in the way it was first of all there are kind of um uncertainties how siphons were really working what were their actual performance uh there are many reconstructions in this sense but until you don't have the the exact evidence uh from history you it's difficult really to to tell how it truly really was and in any case from from the way we know it could uh, at least we think it could work um you realize that first of all such a system had a limited range hmm? and secondly it had it definitely required both calm conditions and a following wind now, this is particularly important uh liquid fire was best suited for um, the use in, in closed waters like the, the Marmara Sea, for instance, where you know more or less what the currents are, because you know just just the the, the wind turns, you can't get burnt in turn. And 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 since the 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 liquid fire still burns uh, when uh, on water, well, that's also something that can mess up things pretty pretty quickly. So the um, the idea is that first of all ships had to be very close to the enemy in order to uh, shoot a liquid fire um, and and that uh, probably this was happening in a phase where they could somewhat either disengage or why the clash was already ended in, in some way um, because first of all conventional missiles and projectiles they were really the first weapons around there pretty much the standard one for every fleet I repeat not just in the Byzantine and the Saracen one but also in the um, in the Viking ones in, in the Rus ones etc um, uh, were the, the first weapon and um, they were effectively what battles were won with right and and they had a much longer range, right, in themselves. So even the chance of being able to use Greek fire was uh, subordinated to certain to to having advanced in a certain stage of the fight, and that we will see how it we we think it, it, it evolved. Um, and the uh, and, and another idea is that if you know that the enemy has Greek fire, you don't really get close to it. So you will you're not so willing to approach the enemy, but you keep maybe hitting him uh, at distance not to you know to get in the range of the siphons right
Um, so uh, that could leave the, the Byzantines sitting ducks at that point. Um, the, as we were saying before, the spore also was um, not designed to puncture the hull and sink the ship, but rather to destroy its motive power by smashing its oars. Um, and uh, and there, were, there was no other way to, to sink um, uh, an enemy ship uh, aside from set, putting it on, on fire. So the, uh, the, the general uh, battle tactics were aimed at this um, uh, degrading, uh, achieving this the attrition of enemy forces that in turn, however, were doing the same thing with you because once you were at range um, of them, they were at range of you. So it, 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 you couldn't really escape from that technology and so it was. So the idea is that compared to the ancient world where instead there was this idea of knocking out with a single blow even uh, you know uh, put um, the the enemy ship with with uh, with the with a ram um tactics had um, transformed uh, with, and which doesn't mean that they got inferior but they simply adapted to the to the circumstances to um to first of all you know, have increased having this increased uh, firepower, let's say, in terms of, of of missiles and projectiles on board, and also the ability to resist to an eventual boarding, right, and or at least to escape capture. So this was particularly important. By the way, ships are very expensive, um, not just to build but also to maintain. So it's something you don't want to fall into your enemies' hands. Also because they were full of uh, ammo and and supplies and all this stuff. So um, that's uh, pretty. You know, losing one ship, it this, the, the 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 fleets were not very large in general. So, and we will see afterwards from a strictly strategical point of view what they really served to, which was mostly assisting. Uh, land operations where they're in engaging into pure maritime warfare uh, in itself. So, um, as you can imagine, as a consequence, this is, uh, the preliminary phases of the battle had become uh, way, uh, the, the most important ones. The, the ones in which uh, the, the world, most of the battle was, was, was fought, exchanging uh, missiles of various type. Now, there is a debate also considering what the the Byzantine capabilities as um, as a, a sea man and and, and and mariners and generally that their their um, maritime quality really was. Hmm. This is the idea that the Byzantine Empire was the major naval power out there, and it's kind of correct. There wasn't, uh, I believe, even if you count the cases in which there were other maritime powers, the Byzantine Empire was the one that was kind of more solid had this very structured um, uh, political unity and military administration um, and all of that it was largely an empire kind of revolving on the sea in terms of especially of trade etc uh, yet um, there is not really um, uh, this first dimension like sometimes the Byzantine Empire is painted as a maritime power point. No, uh, this is really false, actually. The Byzantine Empire was mainly and largely and overwhelmingly, as any other power of the time, a land power. Mm -hmm. um, fleets were definitely important, um, but they had this reduced strategical effectiveness. Now, the, the Byzantines were also great sailors uh, that, you know, were so keen on, on the sea, etc. There is not the, even this huge uh, evidence either. I mean, we have no historical evidence that the Byzantine sailor on average was better than, say, the Egyptian sailor, the Italian sailor, the Russian sailor. We, we don't really know, right? So obviously the Byzantines having the best ships at this time, the, the largest fleets, they, they knew how to, to make uh, the thing, especially in organizational terms, and also manning ships that often were larger than ones of the enemy, especially if you take um, the ones of the Rus, for example, that were uh, sailing with, with river boats, essentially, even when they went up to the gates of Constantinople. Not the Arabs, evidently, that had uh, comparable uh, ships, actually, the, the, the same the type. Um, but um, there is evidence of um, the... Uh, there is no evidence, actually, that uh, Byzantine seamen were uh, more skilled uh, than other the, the ones of other opponents, at least 
there is no way actually even maybe we don't know it might have been true actually we, we simply we don't know we don't have the evidence of this um, the um, in looking at a ratio of um, victories um, and defeats um, first of all the um, in general the 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 advantage let's say that generally speaking the the advantage out of the Byzantines at sea um, most of the times in their history was due to the um, to fighting in their homeland they're close to home right if you take for example the expeditions against the uh, I mean the, the military operations against the the, the Rus um, you realize that those guys were sailing basically through the Russian and Ukrainian rivers, getting to the Black Sea, then going down the Balkans, and finally getting to Constantinople. Now, that was a, a, a pretty huge problem for them in terms of supplies, logistics, and so on. So the Byzantines fighting in there were usually advantaged. They had much less hurry, they had uh, more resources at ease. So many of the victories, even the ones against the um, the the defeats um, you know the defeats of the Muslim assaults on Constantinople in 672 78 and in 17 uh, 717 uh, 718 were related to this like he said you know your favorite advantage by campaigning in home waters rather than hundreds of miles from sources of supplies right so this was something that you know that you could really count on not to venture too far um, if you really don't really don't want to risk um, uh, your fleet. This is the same um, the um, the uh, let's say aside from this edge given by liquid fire, um, it seems that other victories like the ones achieved in 822-23 against Thomas the Slav were you know attributable to this kind of strategical advantage more than the tactical advantage arriving from whichever you know quality the Byzantines had or, or, or weapon like in fact Greek fire um, and if you were to look at Byzantine victories at sea you, you realize that it wasn't such a, a an impressive uh, amount so there is the Veneto Byzantine victory in this period at Syracuse in 827 28 mm -hmm. uh, then the, um, the, uh, the the storm of the Muslim fleet of Cape uh, Caledonia in 842, uh, the victory of Niketas uh, Orifas over the Cretans in the Gulf of Corinth in 879, Nazar's uh, victories of um, Western Greece and uh, and of uh, Punta uh, Stilo in 880, the victory of Imerius. Mm? Uh, at the beginning of the 10th century, uh, the defeat of Leo of Tripoli of Lemnos in 923, the victory of Basil uh, Examilitis over the fleet of, of Tarsus of Lita in 956, and the defeat of uh, uh, an Egyptian uh, naval squadron of Cyprus in 965. So uh, on the other hand, you see uh, uh, an amount of impressive uh, defeats, uh, to say the least, of the Byzantine navy. There is the one of Constance II at the Battle of the Masts of uh, Phoenicus in uh, 655. It's a kind of important battle. Um, the defeat of Theophilus. Um, there was, uh, the, there was um, uh, Strategos of the uh, Kiburayotai of Antalya in 790, the defeat of Tassus in 839, the defeat of Constantine Contomites of Syracuse in 859, the annihilation of the Byzantine fleet of Milazzo in 888, the defeat of Messina in 901, the disastrous defeat of Imerius north of Chios in 912, the defeat of an expedition in the Straits of Messina in 965 and the defeats of Tripoli in 975 and 998. So, 
you, you if you really compared both, you realize that yeah, Byzantine navy can be best around apparently, but it's not that this equated to victory all the time. And uh, on the contrary, there were uh, there is this impressive list of of, of military disasters as well um, into the Byzantine navy. So the the uh, even the uh, the quality of the men uh, of the empire's uh, crews doesn't seem to be to have particularly high. We know of um, certain mutinies that happened, for instance, in the twenties of the ninth century. Um, some of these mutinies were, however, seemingly related to political and problems. For instance, some of them. Uh, the, for instance, the revolt that we mentioned before of the Kibura Yotai um, seamen um, uh, had, uh, by, by supporting Thomas the Slav was due to uh, uh, the problem of, of, of iconoclasm. That this is at least why, in, in the sources, it's all these guys rebelled. Um, there were other. Um, there might have been actually other factors. Uh, Behind it, because it was very easy at the time to say, "Oh, that guy's an iconoclast," you know, and this could mask actually major structural problems at that time for an entire theme rebelling, and not and and, and having its own navy um, sailing forth for. By the way, uh, if you think about it strateg strategically, as just a, a detail, um, it, it's a bit what I was telling to you before that all the various teams of the um, of the uh, Byzantine Empire. Uh, of course, had their own fleets. You know, if they were obviously uh, also, uh, you know, naval, uh, they had access to the sea, etc. So, in many ways, like just the land army, um, this uh, fleets came together uh, every once, uh, you know, in a while in the major expeditions, and and every theme had its own times and and re and strengths, etc. So, um, there was a much of the political uh, political bargaining and and you have to take into consideration all the internal let's say rivalries and revolts that you know the Byzantine Empire is kind of rich at this time in fact there were other uh, mutinies of the Byzantine fleet um, with uh, the re uh, uh, an occasion of the rebellions of Bardas Scleros in 976-79 and Bardas Phocas in 987-89 and uh, it, it, it's clear that, that there were reasons um, r related to this, also in terms of the, you know, of the refusal of the military service. Right? We we know that this it, it happened. For example, in 880, that uh, during the expedition under the command of Nazar um, to counter the attack of the, uh, the Aglabid uh, fleet in the Ionian Sea, that the, uh, the there was a problem to, to, to they had to stop. The, uh, at least to, to stop temporarily the expedition because that Methone was a desertion of a large part of the crew. Um, and uh, we don't really know uh, whether they, uh, you know, they d why they deserted. And there is just one source, the Vita Basili, that states that, you know, the crewmen had deserted because they were terrified in the face of danger of the enemy, but it doesn't quite sound, um, you know, it, it's count, it sounds simplistic. Um, at best, and and there is also one uh, episode actually narrated uh, in the life of San Nelos of of Rosano, his other source, in the 10th century, where where the populace of Rosano in Calabria destroyed a fleet of their own of their own Byzantine Tema to avoid. Uh, serving to it, so pretty effective. You know, you are a community that has to serve the Byzantines with giving ships, by the way, that are paid with you, the, the sweat of your uh, of your work, etc., and, and and your tears, etc. So uh, you you just destroy the fleet and you let the empire without uh, actually a pro, uh, you know profitable um, strategical uh, uh, sound strategical asset like an. Uh, a navy at the time could be. Navies were very rare. It's very important to stress in here the material poverty of the early medieval world. So having a, you know enough surplus to mount up a, 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 na a, you know, a, a navy expedition, naval expedition, was something incredibly uh, extra, very extraordinary, and and it costed a lot 
it's not the, the the empire in general sent military expedition with a whole army or or fleet you know every year the the, the weren't resources those could effectively dry up the wool there were local resources even for generations so that's why there was even this probably partially at least this kind of defensivism this thing of you know being be very prudent not to risk everything one one shot we will see more cre clearly um afterwards um the um the the idea is if you read a cons uh, the constitution number 18 of Laude VI tactica uh, the emperor uh, advises uh, his strategoi to attack the Muslims at sea if they were invading by land and to assault their territory left undefended by any of their naval expeditions. Right, so um, the um, uh, the the idea in here is that uh, you really attack the enemy where he has. Uh, no defense there, and and this this is hap this this is what happened incidentally also with the Rus that attacked Constantinople while the Imperial army was was uh, uh, in, uh, deployed somewhere else couldn't intervene so there was this mm, you know idea of never l l also from the other side not to leave uncovered your your core territories by you know if, if by leaving with the army and, and the fleet um, the 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 idea is that the fleet accompany, however, also the the terrestrial operations. For example, while the um, the once the the Byzantine army was crossing the Taurus uh, mountains um, to enter into to the south towards Syria, Cilicia uh, actually or Kilicia is was uh, named. Um, there were certain Byzantine squadrons, so not entire uh, fleets actually, but you know some consistent naval units that were attacking the coastal centers of Tarsus and Adana. So that the idea is was to, in this sense, to distract the the enemy, catching it in, uh, in between two fires, right? So that actually the navy was also used to, obviously. Uh, land troops to carry to carry troops and to uh, make them land, and there are other constitutions uh, like the 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 twentieth that actually recommends to take action quite swiftly, um, and uh, ordering in one case um, the uh, in the twenty constitution number twenty below the sixth to preemptively strike from Cyprus. Against the individual fleets, Muslim fleets of Egypt, Syria, and and Kilikia, or Cilicia, uh, Cilicia actually, um, uh, before they could unite. So here, th this was a brief moment in in in, in this time, which Cyprus had been uh, retaken uh, temporarily from the Byzantines. So um, uh, this was the idea of having. Uh, caught the the Muslims by surprise in this sense. The the, the, the idea was non do not give them time to reunite to reorganize, attack their fleets once they are separated. So this is a very interesting disposition, because so uh, it also proves that the Egyptian, Syrian, and Cilician uh, regions had their own their own fleet, right? And those were by the way regions that had been previously Byzantines, so they. They had those same uh, facilities and infrastructures or, or traditions actually at this time by the 10th century that, however, were of of ancient origin. I mean, these were lands that stayed under Roman domination for centuries and centuries, and were famous, in fact, for their uh, shipyards, their their uh, their naval traditions, um, etc. Um, so. Um, then we don't have further uh, knowledge of how eventually this thing uh, went, but it's particularly important because obviously you have the, uh, the sur not just the surprise effect here, uh, but the the chance of taking the individual s fleets separated so that you can crush them one by one instead of risking one bigger fleet that you know all together can can definitely reduce the odds for you to win uh, it. Um, and, and this gives you also the kind of strategical range of this uh, fleets. Actually, uh, traveling by sea is pretty quick, 
right? And pretty economic in terms of at least, you know, compared of tr t from to, to, to uh, moving on land, right? So uh, we don't have to think of, uh, you know, uh, a sort of, um, of a reduced uh, naval activity because of the... Um, because of uh, uh, you know these sh uh, fleets were 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 slow or they couldn't do much. Actually, they could be very fast. The problem is that they had to catch the right occasion and also mounting them costed really a lot. But in terms of naval technology, given that this was mostly coastal navigation, etc., uh, you know, with all the limitation, the galleys they had to stop uh, and all this stuff. It was still a pretty quick way of moving, and actually the preferred one. Uh, here we are in the 10th century. Uh, you realize that uh, in a few centuries, um, all over Europe, you'd say that the, the fastest way to, to, to travel would become uh, via sea. Mm. And you see it from with the Crusades, like the first one was on land and conceived like that. The third one was already now. Nobody thought anymore to, to go into Near East. Uh, on uh, you know simply you know on, on land it was considered too too risky too costly etc. Um, and by the way, consider even the geography here, especially in the Aegean Sea. You rarely have one spot of sea where you can't see land. So this this is what also historically in perspective had developed even things like the Atlantic uh, Navy and all this stuff because you're incentivated. You have all these several logistical points then in the eastern mediterranean yes east of east of roads it's kind of more complicated there is cyprus as a major as a major base but then it's all there are not either either other islands in there um so the, the byzantines had ways to even uh, i don't know about signaling from uh, in, like in the agency because one problem we'll see now was also how do you really cover in terms of sight uh, the the sea surface. I mean, how could really spot each other at which distance and how uh, uh, much uh, s uh, sea surface can a fleet um, patrol and control? But we will see now. Um, the okay. So one character of naval battles of, at the time was also unpredictability, right? So you, as we said before, we didn't have the uh, the major, uh, you know, uh, winning card you could play uh, and win. Everything was based on, uh, I would say, the skill of the crews chiefly. What you see in, especially in this, um, even in later times of galley warfare, etc., is that against our modernism and technologism is that it was not really having the best weapon or more weapons, but having actually the best crew. To mend them, to mend the ship, etc. And this all this has always been like that. Um, it's not about weaponry, but it's actually about skill. So it's never technology as always, but it's the doctrine. Let's eradicate violently these technologistic prejudices, uh, prejudices because they are pretty pretty dumb uh, in the first place. Um, and also weaponry, as we've seen, in fact, at the time didn't uh, give that uh, you know you know edge. Uh, as everybody was using more or less the same weapons. Liquid fire was this Byzantine prerogative, but also, as we've seen, it, it doesn't appear historically to have been a determining factor. And, and the Byzantines lost at least as much as they want. So this is a, a, a draw at best. And, you know, yeah, liquid fire, but, you know... In, I would say that, historiographically speaking, there is this tendency typical of the... Uh, Hellenic and Hellenistic, um, say, scientific interests to focus on uh, that we also narrated in our technological prejudice. Uh, it, it is it was exactly this idea that you have the 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 technology that is so sophisticated and superior. Uh, everything should revolve around that. That's the typical um, Hellenic mindset. The Romans, for example, had a completely different mindset. They were interested in, 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 in pragmatism, and especially when you have a, a very big military power that is effectively some of the largest and most important. You, you see that they rarely have, uh, compared to other smaller uh, powers, um, 
that thing for technology really they, what they're mostly interested in here is finding the the resources to keep the whole thing standing so they're inter they're more interested in average what really works right and not trying to invest on the technology that m especially at this time in terms of 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 potential was pretty pretty low so um we should be able at least in my opinion to to separate what you read in the in the same Byzantine sources that were by the way mostly kind of aristocratic sources or even imperial sources that were written in the imperial milieu and the reality of the same Byzantine warfare and this is what we lack historically speaking most of the times when we study sources about warfare etc is that uh, we know how it was seen from the the aristocrat at the top which had maybe the time to and the skill, the, the literacy to write things down and to conceive them in this greater, you know, uh, I can say grand strategy mindset, but, you know, still with kind of ambitions of, uh, you know, uh, didactical uh, result, you know, in, in general, in this general scope and what was known by the men that really made the thing work. The NCOs, um, the same crew, uh, crews, etc. So, I think that even that great passion for the liquid fire and all this mythology that has developed around it is is a little bit to be resized. At least, it's not that it wasn't important, even at least, but it's still you know what really made the difference was something else, right? And it was something that everybody could have. Doesn't matter whether you're Byzantine, if you're Muslim, you whatever. Uh, you know, the 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 sea is this great uh, brings to this great hybrid of uh, every kind of t of knowledge of technology, and it, it had been in the Mediterranean like that since forever, basically. So, even trying to to make this strict differentiation is pretty dangerous in terms of of a strictly military historical terms, because it it it, it you risk to to have this optical distortion caused by the written sources, which is cool, which is the one you can read and you can relate to, but the practice is, is, is something you don't see. Uh, uh, and and you, that, that doesn't make you realize what, what is that really mattered, right? Um, and the, and, and banally, when you look at these battles, uh, even things like, uh, first of all, the most important thing is admiralship, right? You know, command, leadership in general, but also numbers more panelling. Like, the whole thing was revolving, as we have seen with the, the, the Constitution before it said, you know, attack the enemies when they are separated. Well, that's a matter of mathematics, right? So it, it doesn't say, you know, fight in this fashion, just that go attack and annihilate. It's very pragmatic, actually, and, and, and pretty effective if it was ever to be uh, achieved. Um, and uh, you already you can already know that. So really, strategies and tactics revolved around this, even sometimes more banal. You don't have to look into the the extreme detail to understand how this this went on. Mm -hmm. By analogy, you can understand it even through military logic, etc. And uh, and it was a great, um, you know, uh, unpredictability brought definitely to this defensivistic attitude, both strategically and tactically. That is, do not s sail off, do not go out there if you are not sure that you have a uh, substantial advantage, right? Unfortunately, most of the times, this advantage does not exist, because, by the way, if, if, that, ex if that existed, probably the enemy didn't sh wouldn't show up, and that's what it makes even fights, you know, uh, you know, unpredictable because you know if you know that there is a huge fleet around you don't even say off you remain where you are or maybe you don't even invest in that maybe you you invest on on coastal defense from land which was definitely even way more effective um, so committing to battle was a risk that in predictable fortunes of, of war uh, uh, you know, wouldn't really make you hope at least of uh, the size of victories, uh, etc. And and also, with the same strategical re uh, utility of, of the fleets, you, you yeah, you can crush an enemy at sea, but what do you do then? 
What does it effectively change with the technology of the 10th century AD? At that state you're fighting is still alive. You have to retreat at one point. You can't do massive damage, you can't destroy maybe certain facilities, etc. But th the real problem there is bringing troops on land. That's what all naval warfare at the time was really about. So it wasn't about the naval tactic in itself, it was really the broader uh, strategical uh, need of you know seizing things like fortified places etc and this obviously happened on land <laughs> not on sea um, although naturally coastal centers had these major advantages also being you know resupplyable from sea uh, uh, etc um, and and it was relatively quick to replace ships um, uh, and even you know fairly skilled crews, right? So uh, it's um, I mean those were valuable assets that, as we have seen, for the uh, crop rates of the time were difficult to replace in general. But uh, you still, you could find someone who could put up, you know, create at least. Uh, and this is something that uh, a response to that. Think about the Battle of of Lepanto in in. 1571. You know, that's something, you know, the whole Ottoman fleet is annihilated. What do the Christians do? Well, not much, because f first of all, they start quarreling among each other. But at the same time, it was a major, you know, enterprise to even think to go up there to Constantinople, to besiege it, because the whole problem was not the um, maritime power as such. Uh, as a general note, uh, the uh, the the ability to really block a sea to really cause major uh, strategical damages with a fleet etc uh, is is in Victorian comes possible into the Victorian age before it was impossible you couldn't fully close a sea a, a trade of sea and pretend that you blocked the enemy you made this enormous this major strategical damage etc everything was extremely difficult to control think about the continental block in Napoleonic times. Uh, the same French at one point paid for the British for, uh, you know, countering the, the the traffickers that still existed that were exploring. So it, it it's very complicated, right? So caution was like the first thing you have to think about, and uh, there was this um, other treatise from the uh, the 10th century from the from Syrianos uh, Magistros or Magistros. So this um, Syrian master, the uh, Byzantine, that, ad that advised that a fleet should always proceed with four light and, f and fast scout ships ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and at a distance of up to two or six miles, so that, um, there, um, or that the, the other two bet between them and the fleet could, could see each other, right? Um, the the idea was creating this kind of uh, cord of, of, of communication um, and this uh, interest for intelligence is uh, particularly important because everything was aimed at retreating in the case the uh, superior enemy especially in numbers uh, was spotted and, and, and therefore you could retreat with, without any and this was probably very effective because at, w at that point you know even speed yeah okay terms of it depends on the wind and all this stuff but uh, still uh, these ships are not super fast so at least you can um, you can try to seek a, a better place you can go back and it also depends what what that that fleet is up to really um, the um, uh, this um, idea of planning every attack with fourth thought is definitely repeated by uh, Leo the sixth and uh, the only uh, confidence that you could have was when you, you know, you were blatantly superior over the enemy, mm. and it's only at that point you could crush it. I don't, I don't think there are numbers here, proportions of, of strength. It also depends, but you know, usually in military terms, when you have three to one in terms of strength, you that you have a fair advantage. You can basically. Uh, wipe out the other the the enemy, um, and 
also one major interest was to preserve therefore all of your forces like and to uh, especially um, sharpen your your mind you know finding out some stratagem that would enable uh, enable um, you to to attack the enemy with the least risk to your own forces mm -hmm. and w one one great advantage as we were saying before derived from fighting on your own um, uh, on your own waters right so um, the uh, the idea is that you have closest uh, supplies um, uh, resupplying uh, centers you know you know the coast you know you can um, lay ambushes to the enemy uh, ambushes were practiced very frequently as much as on land and the Byzantines were really great advocates of such tactics were very experts to them um, I think somewhere else is written is that in order to discourage, um, you know, re uh, retreat, uh, you, uh, it was also profitable to fight uh, in front of an enemy of uh, the enemy coast, so that there was no place where to retreat, and therefore the crews would be more um, motivated to 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 achieve victory. But in general, the the, the real advantage came from the other from the opposite from fighting close to your own land and this advice uh, confirms that uh, na medieval uh, naval warfare was definitely all about coastal navigation so that everything was um, set was regulated uh, on the base of how close was the land what kind of land was it uh, whose land was it right so uh, there was no way to control maritime space for a prolonged time and in large over large surfaces as we were s saying before the expanses of the sea were too vast these galleys had limited water supplies chiefly uh, because food was stored pretty easily they, they usually ate things like biscuits that have this concentrated caloric uh, content that you can store in you know, a small volume so for food it was not a big deal uh, the, the real problem was water that also occupies a lot of space of a lot of volume etc um, so the the galleys had to rest the crews couldn't uh, uh, or uh, all, all, uh, all the time um, they had to stop and they had to to, to land right so this is this this is how it had always been since the ancient times so you also needed to by the way know the coast and knowing uh, the stopping points you couldn't take many other paths in that, in that, in that direction um, and thinking even about visibility uh, at the time like it was up to a few uh, not very uh, such a few before so you couldn't really control the sea right in terms of sight, uh, we can think that, well, the standard Roman have, uh, has this kind of like 10 meters and a half um, mast over the, 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 the above the sea level, right? So uh, uh, there, uh, of, of course, there were larger ships, but this, this was kind of the average, so the... The, the 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 even the the larger ships didn't have anything that was taller than two meters, so basically with a four mast uh, uh, height of ten and a half meters, you can come to look up to maximum uh, twelve kilometers, uh, probably even something less. So even if you were on the peak of uh, a Latin sail. That was something like uh, 20 meters uh, above the sea, above the sea level. Sometimes you could see up to like 50 kilometers away. Um, now, no man can see uh, with an aided sight at the time more than you know, I think 60, 65 kilometers. So, on average, let's say that visibility was standard visibility was to 15, 20 kilometers, right? Um, from the masthead of the Droman, by the way. Um, so, uh, in in this sense, even scout ships, uh, in order to remain inside, 
couldn't space more than 30, 40 kilometers in advance of a fleet, and probably no more than 30, right? So uh, the by the way, these ships were probably also um, uh, the, probably the, they were even smaller than the standard galley, so they had even lower mastheads. So this all went reduced, and by other attrition factors, you can imagine this to be a very. By the way, there was also the problem of signaling. Um, you know, you can't have a ship that is 30, 40 kilometers away, but you can't see, you can't communicate, uh, if not with. I don't know, if you make smoke signals that, by the way, are still very, you know, and they naturally cannot express a very complex um, uh, message, but uh, they probably were used. But the, the treatises, uh, the treatises do, do not speak about this specifically, not even on light signaling. It's strange, kind of, loud six didn't, didn't talk about this. Um, and um, Sirianus Ma Magistros uh, advises that a fleet should always proceed with scout ships on hand up to six miles or so. Mm -hmm. So two scout ships should be there for six miles ahead and another two should be between them and the fleet to relay any messages. So they try to compensate in this way, so going back and forth, but you know, uh, communicate. It takes time, first of all, and then communication is can be also rendered more difficult. Can uh, the situation can evolve also in different ways. Um, you have to assess what's going on. If you start seeing something on the horizon, you don't know what it is. It takes a lot of time before you realize what what's going on. So everything can is way less efficient in many ways than you can imagine. And there is also the decisional proce process of the commander in, in there, everything in this fog of war is pretty pretty dramatic, as you understand. Um, the so if you consider this forward scout ships to have a range of visibility of some other eight sixteen kilometers, probably the real maritime space that could be observed was only around twenty five kilometers at best, right? So uh, not really a few, but still, you know, if you take into consideration the geographical dimension. I mean, think about the Straits of Otranto between Italy and the Balkans. It's something like 110 kilometers. Um, the entrance to the Aegean between Crete and Rhodes is something like 180 kilometers wide. So, you know, it, it's 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 kind of complicated to, <laughs> to even pretend you can't control such passages that by the way, were crucial for for because the world empire basically developed in, in, into this into these spaces. It was essentially uh, the the Aegean, uh, the the southern Adriatic, uh, the Black Sea, uh, the south coast of Asia Minor. Yeah, that's that's essentially it. And uh, and all this considering, by the way, weather conditions. It's obvious that, uh, well, it's true that the Mediterranean doesn't have so many banks of fog and all this stuff, but, you know, still things can get pretty uh, pretty difficult um, in terms of visibility uh, as well. And, and there, there are all the ruses, like, you know, it was typical to, to show some flag or another, these this are all the tricks of now warfare, all, if you watch every kind of movie settled in, you know, in, in the past, now of Warford, it's always like that. What kind of uh, of a flag you're showing and all this stuff. Um, so, as we were saying before, um, um, it's very important to understand the secondary, the very secondary nature of fleets compared to land armies, right? Um, sea power was important, was it? But it was merely an, an adjunct to uh, that of land. Which, um, and it by itself, it's r it rarely achieved much in the first place. Um, and, and even certain attempts, by the way, think about the reconquest of Crete in 960 and 961. That is normally said, oh wow, the Byzantines took out, uh, you know, they, they got it all in one shot. Yeah, but they had tried already four times, at least previously, failing. So uh, that was definitely a big achievement, but it's kind of an exception to the rule. So it's not that you can't do that enormous much uh, with a fleet um, 
if you don't have any other strategical factors that are mostly related to uh, advantages that are mostly related to what is going on on land. Um, and if you look at Byzantine military history, you realize that the uh, that most naval military naval expeditions were uh, were were done were accompanying um, terrestrial expeditions. Mm -hmm. So this was particularly important, chiefly for supplies. Right before we said that um, sea transportation was much faster, much more economical because way less attrition, way, uh, way less energy to be consumed uh, than, than the land one and this was one of the major reasons why all armies were kind of followed that but even on land, I mean usually uh, with very big armies have this uh, logistical needs especially of water you have to think that an army of like even 30,000 men if it doesn't have an enormous amount of water pretty close that is a, a, a river or a lake or something, it, it, really, it really dies of thirst. And I'm not talking about places like Syria or Egypt, I'm talking about even Central Europe. Um, uh, that's how it works. So it was normal for every major expedition, if it was possible to go along a waterway, that could be exploited also for um, transporting uh, supplies. And this was very effectively done uh, uh, via sea, if obviously uh, if, um, let's say armies were uh, marching through along the coast chiefly um, also because the major, by the way, the major cities, the major centers, especially in this uh, Muslim lands the Byzantines were fighting against or like even uh, like in in, in, uh, in in the Near East or in Italy um, were, were were pretty solidly urbanized, had a lot of, uh, of, of coastal centers so that's also around which the, the region you want to revolve around. And the, the Byzantine Empire was chiefly re revolving around coastal cities. Not at this time, cities were enormously developed in the Byzantine Empire. As a matter of fact, there were a very few, like Constantinople was the, the really big one. Then Thessalonica, chiefly. But in other areas, there were other coastal centers that were important to hold. Uh, the aforementioned uh, maritime republics were all city states because they were inside cities along the coast and and those you know once you take a city that's the real asset you want to invest in it's a fortified place that can't be taken easily from and it can be resupplied re by sea a great deal of why even many coastal centers in places like Italy were maintained in the hands of the Byzantines while the interland was someone else's is that they could be supplied by 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 sea, and that the, this land powers normally didn't have fleets to to compete with a Byzantine one, right? So um, this is how vital it was. And you, in fact, if you look at the Byzantine Empire this time, you did the interland, even a few tens of kilometers inland, was something radically different from what the coastal world. Think about the Slavization of the interland, even in up to the Peloponnese, or you know what happened in the interland was relatively important compared to what was happening into the coastal centers albeit of course the agricultural resources were still of you know, the interland were the ones that made the, the the system working and those regularly flowed towards the city center because they could be exported so there wasn't even the need to coerce the uh, populations of the interland in order to achieve that because the important thing was to hold the city it was usually a, an economical a trade center right um so the um in many ways um military um i mean naval battles um broke out usually in, in this context like you know patrolling the uh the coast and spotting uh enemy fleet it was doing usually something else rather than patrolling as well it was maybe supporting one, uh, one, one military expedition, and this, by the way, we'll we'll observe it more, um, more, more in detail uh, later with talking about the spies. But uh, there is another problem that is intertwined with the one of sight: is that you can't really spot like a patrol so easily. I mean, during the year, um, you know that given the currents, the winds, etc. 
it's more likely that a fleet is going to pass through that um, that strait uh, because it's as if you know if we were to look at a map of the sea, especially in Mediterranean, you see all these um, whirlwinds uh, of of currents that uh, those guys really knew, knew all by heart. Um, and that they knew that in that certain phase of the year there was that wind that speed in that direction, so they, that's how they usually ambushed each other. But the problem is that that these expeditions were also rare. So the best way to to even say off to say let's go attack them was knowing that it was a major naval expedition was usually accompanied by a, an even larger land uh, land operation land expedition. And that's why they usually encounter each other. So surprise was not really enormous, at least at a broader strategical level, right? It could happen, but um, you know the general activities were already known out there through spies and trade and all this stuff. And and if you think about it, um, so ships defend also supply lines in this sense. So you always have kind of warships that are... There is not a huge differentiation, actually, between cargo ships and, and ships. The, the work, uh, warships are quite, kind of similar in some ways, but obviously uh, most of the cargo ships are just cargo ships, while you know ju uh, only a minor part of, of the warships are... Uh, I mean, all the ships are are for fighting. Also because there are marines on board still... As we will see later, in terms of tactics, you you have to man this this ships as, as if they were military units on land. So there is also an additional cost to that. You don't have all the ships re really filled with with troopers. The wide majority of the fleet is going to be made of 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 cargo ships. Or uh, it it really depends actually. But with with these larger operations and given the uh, supply uh, system required for land troops, well, in these major operations, that's really the case. Of course, it's just a squadron, a patrol, sent out there for sinking someone or raiding. Uh, well, that, yeah, that's most, that's usually um, probably self-sufficient. There are no cargo ships, can slow down, etc. But in these major operations, there, are this, there is this major attrition as well that uh, includes other kind of non-military vessels. Um, the, um, and, and the real problem, in fact, was, uh, you know, being caught by the enemy on land. It was one of the major, in fact, it, it, it's, it's very frequent to have the, the, the uh, actually the highest number of losses at this point are the ones of, uh, of ships that were stranded, that were at least, you know, landed, uh, moored, uh, onto enemy land and were assaulted all of a sudden. So it was is uh, either by land or by uh, by sea. So that was th that was really usually the, the easiest thing to do because there are other things you have to take to consideration. In fact, you dismount from the ship when it's moored. It, it, you're you're not. It's not on water. The the crew is not ready. So if an enemy fleet surprises you, well, you have a pretty big disadvantage. You can at least make a lot of um, the enemy can make a lot of damage to the ships proper. Maybe from the sea you can uh, try to hit the enemy ships as well, but you know it, it's still not very good if you rely on those ships, say, to come back to to f uh, find yourself in such a situation. And the and there is also a great amount of uh, records of fleets destroyed at sea by storms, right? Um, that, and these records contemplate the horrific uh, loss of human life involved uh, into this, and uh, and this was also, yeah, the force of nature that intervenes as mashes. In fact, actually, uh, if possible, it was preferable for, <laughs> for you to, to let, uh, you know, a storm uh, or the rocks to destroy the enemy, the enemy fleet, not really uh, assault in it, and and part probably part of the um, of the strategy rely, relied on this. Uh, you have to think that knowledge of uh, climatic conditions and all that was fundamental to this. If you knew that 
bad weather was was coming, you know, why not, uh, you know, mooring somewhere and waiting for the enemy to maybe stay out there searching for you if you can. So even many confrontations dealt with these problems. And by the way, weather is also not so scientifically predictable, not even today, with clarity. So it's it's something that can uh, really uh, that represents a, a pretty um, variable factor and unpredictable factor uh, in general. Um, there is, um, given the secondary importance of naval warfare to terrestrial one, uh, you see that in, in the Byzantine hierarchies, uh, both the political and military ones, the the naval commanders were way <laughs> lower in the rank than, than any other. Like, were only two uh, Byzantine emperors that had been formerly um, admirals, uh, that are Tiberius III and Romanos I uh, Lecapenus. Um, and the... Um, and, and th there are very few uh, occasions in which you see emperors taking command of 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 the uh, of the of the fleet in itself. For instance, Constance the Second, we remember before, did it at the Battle of the Masts at Phoenicus in 655, with all its disastrous consequences. And uh, the uh, you know while you know emperors Byzantine emperors normally will would would guy would be the leaders of of armies on land as a regular activity it was expected to to be the case that there was a lot of ethos even in in the kind of sophisticated and detached um imperial idea uh, byzantine imperial ideal that the the emperor was a warrior a fighter at least and that had to command men into battle but rarely into into fleets right um, and it's full of evidence, actually, of, uh, if you even count all the ranks uh, of generals and officers, etc., the admirals ranked very, very uh, low in into this. They, they hadn't the same importance of, 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 um, of, of terrestrial commanders that had much greater... Uh, responsibilities and they were paid they were also paid much less they were rewarded with way less land right so this naturally speaks for the the really strategical importance that was tributed to uh, to the, the Navy in itself mm -hmm. so any appreciation on naval warfare this time has to take into consideration that it was firstly coastal and um, uh, amphibious uh, in and therefore in nature as a warfare right and all strategies and tactics revolve around this concept it is pretty standard everywhere right and if you think about ambushes well yeah those are about coastal warfare right uh, this idea of uh, having reserve squadrons hidden uh, behind uh, islands or promontories um, etc in that's not, not something you can do in ICs right um, it was really not the technology to go out there in ICs. It was not convenient. You could do it, but things uh, were, you know, kind of problematic at best. Um, and um, and also it was a problem of of the actual fight because you need kind of calm waters even to engage an enemy fleet, because it was a, a big problem actually also up to very recent times. If you look at 18th century warfare, I don't know, in, at sea it was pretty complicated to point uh, a gun. While you know the 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 sea was pretty uh, pretty agitated, so uh, all the 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 problems. So there was a recommendation on Leo the Sixth to um, attack the enemy fleet when it's stranded or shipwrecked, as he says, um, or scattered by squalls, or, 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 or when it's caught ashore making repairs. Hmm? Um, and he even encourages encourages to attack during a storm at night, uh, because the the idea was that when uh, these troops were moored, they say, okay, well, it's storming, it's night, there's no fleet out there. Instead, well, attack it uh, at that point. However, uh, it, it, this is one of those indications that you say, well, but is it really true? I mean, who would really venture out there at night 
during a storm at sea to attack an enemy close to the coast where you can't have you know rocks and all this stuff you know it, it's pretty complicated by the way um, you know why uh, you know at that point wouldn't you know an enemy fleet be there as well and it was it's kind of a strange uh, um, idea at, at that point and wh by the way what would be the point of attacking like a wreck like a waterlogged ship now it's already lost what <laughs> you have attacked it for of course you can let's say you can take prisoners or stuff like that but it's not really about the assault in itself so th those are kind of the perplexities of reading these manuals to uh, awake you to like what the hell um, and by the way it, it even at night uh, just like on land because even fighting at night on land is it's kind of madness um, you can't see anything uh, how can you you know, arrange this complicated things like maneuvers, formations, etc. If you can't even see uh, visibility is everything. So this is worse even at sea, where you know if you engage an enemy at, uh, in the darkness or even if there is moonlight or something. But you know, uh, everything can. Uh, it, it's dramatically complicated, and especially if it's along the coast. Naturally, you can have some kind of maybe you can't play. I don't know with the moonlights. Um, favor or something like that to to gain an edge or something, but it's very very complicated, and it was really not done that frequent, and it was especially very risky in general, right? Uh, were two ships, uh, two fleets to engage uh, at night, this would the fight would degenerate into a kind of a melee, uh, the consequences of which would have become totally unpredictable, almost, but. And and there are in, in the world medieval naval warfare there are just only two naval battles recorded and uh, so the you know it's it's pretty um, the, there is a reason even if it is systematic into this um, the um, the the one is uh, the 1285 Battle of Las Hormigas, and the other one is actually a Byzantine case, in 880 at uh, under command uh, the Byzantine fleet under the command of Nazar, who destroyed the Alglabid fleet somewhere of uh, Western Greece by deliberately attacking at night. Right and um, in seemingly achieving victory because the Muslims could not um, were co totally unprepared could not arrange for organize themselves for for battle, but you can look at these um, things first of all as complete exceptions like you know like only two battles, and secondly also as a very daring thing like a gamble at least and you know when when you have an entire fleet on your command imperial fleet on your command you don't really risk that i mean it's terrible terrible uh, shame by the way in general in naval warfare it was pretty rare to to even lose ships um you know if you look even in napoleonic um warfare you know ships actually sunk by enemy fire were, were very few but but very very few so you can imagine during the middle ages where there were even less destructive means so um there were definitely other ways like you know ships surrendering that this is how also I, you know the period i studied that in the 14th century is more or less like that uh, also because the ship was a very valuable asset as we explained before um there were other uh, you know, uh, the, there is notice of ambushes. For for example, one of the fleets of Thomas the Slav was um, caught uh, unaware uh, in 822 by the Byzantine fleet somewhere in Thrace um, and destroyed by Greek fire. Uh, so it was probably consequential. I think Greek fire was employed chiefly at the end of, of, of fights for some reason. Um, Maybe to you know wh where the situation was uh, kind of manageable enough to use this weapon kind of s with safety, right? Or maybe to sunk uh, to to sink some ships that could not be taken with them or that were resistant to the death and all this stuff. Um, it's it's 
mm, it's also recorded in 871 practice that you find um, sometimes in actual in all military history I mean you know when this was possible for the size of the ships of a fleet um, transported across uh, I mean by land literally uh, you can't imagine the difficulties for doing such a thing. This was done uh, by Niketas or Orifas in 879 um, uh, across the the Isthmus of Corinth. Uh, the Ottomans would do a similar thing with um, for reaching the Galata uh, uh, l later in the day against the same Byzantines. Um, and uh, this episode of 879. Uh, granted the, uh, the Byzantine fleet to surprise the uh, Cretan Muslims of uh, you know in the Gulf of Corinth, so passing you know into the, the northern side of the isthmus, and defeat them before they had even a chance to rally. So you realize that in this case that there is no technique involved. It's literally ca catching the enemy by surprise, doing something else that has nothing to do with naval stuff because you basically took the navy across by land, you know, by across this must by land. But these are kind of exceptions. We can also question, I mean, the, the, the such things definitely happened, but it, it was not a rule. And, you know, they're probably recorded and they survived in history as uh, as uh, information because it was, you know, something extraordinary in itself. Um, and Definitely, to every good admiral, um, was uh, required to be kind of expert of uh, meteorology, uh, astronomy. Uh, it, at the time, by the way, considered that there were all these kind of mm, pseudo scientifical beliefs, like that they thought that everything was connected, even with the seasons, the stars, the signs of the zodiac, and all this. So. Um, naturally, th this was kind of real physical knowledge mixed with kind of, uh, I mean, scientific knowledge mi mixed with kind of pseudo scientific knowledge at best. But uh, it happens that you know maybe the, the commander does not attack because the stars are not favorable. There, there is this kind of, uh, and and when you read these details, never trust the source. Like it sounds, it always look at what the author wants to to depict. I mean, this happens also for, I don't know, the, the Battle of Myrocephalus in the, uh, 1176 with Michael Comnenus that you know was said you know he was he was cons consulting the astrologers to to know wh where to attack or not. But sometimes this is just to paint maybe a kind of a irrational picture of that figure. And at this time there is nothing like a free thinker in terms of uh, historians, etc. So. It's always very. There are many cliches in, in even reminiscent of classical historiographical traditions that have nothing to do with what was reality at the time. But still, uh, someone believed in these things uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty openly. So it was normal. Even you know, in, in parallel with Christianity, that normally deems this stuff with like superstition. Like uh, the Middle Ages were were like this, really. Um, the and so there was, however, in general, this practical meteorology that every seaman knows about, and uh, this was uh, accompanied with studies and etc. Um, the and 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 this is not something you you learn so quickly. So th there was evidently always uh, some kind of staff on board um, of um, veteran mariners etc. who could assist, especially the young. Um, aristocrats appointed to command of the fleets with their um, astronomical knowledge and meteorological knowledge to, to really to, to to even simply to advise them, not even to teach them. But and the when you look uh, when you look at this treatises, the first thing it, it kind of emerges in your mind is how formal they are. Like this is a prerogative also of other. Uh, Byzantine manuals that they're so kind of uh, I wouldn't say positivistic but they tell you know you just do this this and that that sometimes are kind of logical things that you say okay well that that's obvious but other things are even 
overly complicated or maybe they don't sound very practical so the truth is that it's in here that those historiographical models probably influence uh, the world thing leading you astray from what her reality really was so the reason a very important concept to understand is that when naval expeditions just like land expeditions were mounted up um, nothing was really by surprise there is this idea that you know is fueled by ideas like I don't know that for instance the Huns that were so fast or the Mongols that traveled so fast because they had faster armies etc caught by surprise the Empire etc and uh, making them tilting really no um, you know strategically speaking if there is an army of 30,000 men moving out there you know of, of its intentions and its preparations at least months in advance um, so uh, even without a sp specific uh, spying on, on uh, you know activities sent exactly to, to spot these things you have to think that only through you know travelers merchants etc that were sometimes even spies like uh, diplomats etc all the major strategical moves of a big empire were already known in advance all the time so scouting expeditions to gather intelligence are definitely something you do especially for the sake of tactical uh, needs like wh what is happening really at the moment but strategically speaking you know whether you know the Muslims are invading you or the Byzantines are invading you if you're from you are from the other side um, and it's full of um, the and, and by the way this was trans religious like the Byzantines used Muslim spies all the time the Muslims used Christian spies all the time um, and this this is true also in previous time for, in, for instance uh, Procopius tells that uh, in during the war between uh, the Byzantines and the Sassanids in the same way so uh, there are some um, uh, there are several uh, accounts of major military expeditions or aborted or at least some some movements um, um, caused by the acknowledgement that true spies that uh, the enemy was approaching or something like that this is when, for instance, the the Caliph Moaviyya Ibn Abi Sufyan was raiding, was the governor of Syria at the time, was raiding Cyprus in 648. He was told, he, he, bro he broke off the assault when he was informed by spies there were scouts and ships that were arriving under the um, relieving force of the uh, Cubicularius uh, uh, Kakorizos, um, where it was going against him, so, coming against him. So, um, there is um, uh, also um, the uh, analysis uh, in in the Vita Basili that we we mentioned before. The story of a Muslim spy was sent from Syria um, in to um, for uh, to Constantinople to spy what was going on because. Uh, the uh, there, would, there was this major uh, Muslim ex expedition against uh, the Byzantine Empire, mounted up by Egypt and Syria at the same time around 880, that wanted, in fact, to know what the Byzantines were up to, and and this spy allegedly referred that um, the naval forces at Constantinople were so large that it would have been, you know, kind of impossible now to attack the empire. So. Uh, through this intelligence, the uh, the Muslim uh, go, uh, rulers um, uh, interrupted, aborted this operation, and uh, sometimes you you read them as if they were stories, and, uh, anecdotes, etc. But the, this, uh, even maybe if they're simplified, they really probably tell you the truth about how it really was. That even you know acknowledging that the enemy was um, gathering. Uh, major forces now could be enough to discourage uh, uh, an expedition, and this happened through spies uh, all the time. And and definitely, it didn't happen overnight. It was you know uh, as we were saying before, there was even a, a, cons a continuity in into the knowledge of what what was happening, even just through traders and travelers. I mean, think about all the people who traveled across I don't know Europe, uh, Constantinople. 
the Near East, the holy places in um, Egypt, um, people traveled, people spoke. N never think that even in here in early medieval times, people didn't travel. People traveled a lot for, for those times, standards, for those times, um, resources. Um, and as we were saying before, also the preparation for a major military expeditions could take literally years, right? Preferably months, but sometimes really big ones were really the the investment of a lifetime. Sometimes of entire generations of of of, uh, of sweat and tears, of work of peasants, of uh, you know, uh, and and that's why also all that caution that is required normally to the to the commanders because this were really. Um, exceptional expeditions and as such they were hopefully you know go <laughs> gonna be successful if you um, so um, the as skipping say certain aspects of spying that are obviously there were many even monks sometimes were arrested like in, in Muslim think about the pilgrimage in fact how many pilgrims came from 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 the Byzantine Empire or for from the rest of Europe um, into the Muslim lands some sometimes they were arrested because they the local Muslim ru rulers said oh you know these are spies right and it was true sometimes obviously as uh, you know that was a pretty convenient excuse to come visiting Muslim lands Muslim ruled lands at least um, you know with excuse of visiting holy places maybe doing both things at once you know visiting them saving your soul and um, and spying a little bit um, so yeah and there is this general secrecy surrounding the uh, you know the 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 know how the knowledge you think about liquid fire yeah in several sources in Byzantine history stress that the formula for liquid fire was un was unknown it was hidden only the the imperial um uh, uh, army knew about this um so th there is this even kind of dark stereotype of this, the Byzantines as kind of conspirators that always kept everything. But it's simply because they had a pretty effective uh, espionage system that worked and uh, that was just, you know, kind of but but hard enemies that <laughs> were simply saying, oh, we can't sneak any information out of the Byzantines. And yeah, because it worked. And the... The, the Byzantines were masters of, of espionage, of deception, and all this stuff. And like anyone, by the way, but they they did it better because they were kind of more advanced in certain things. They had a lot long uh, practice and traditions in this matter. Um, and and it was usually this. This was we were talking about before the. The assembly on the fleets coming from all the various uh, teams of the empire that at that point were told where they had to to go. There was a time related to this. Um, that was a moment of testing you know, the allegiance of the various fleets and armies, like you know, calling the one of all the uh, tema of the empire and you know, saying you know, who's loyal to the emperor, etc. Rebellions, as we have seen, and mutinies were pretty pretty frequent. Um, and there is an idea of the sailing formation that, that appears from Leo the Sixth um, that is uh, probably modeled on uh, the strategicon of the Pseudo Maurice that says something pretty strange that basically the the fleets that were sailing for in towards the, the objective had kind of always to to go into the uh, to to proceed in, in a sort of, of formation that had been exercised before. So, and there is a lot of debate around this because we nobody really understands why. Because uh, battle uh, like formations were something very difficult to maintain. I mean, when it's uh, you know when it's a line like a sailing line, it's all very easy. They all go in the same direction along a line, um, and uh, it's fine in a row. But other formations are very complicated to maintain, and and they also slow down significantly the enemy. Um, I mean, the, the the fleet in itself. By the way, what is this formation that they had to exercise? You know, it, it's uh, 
kind of all ships can go in a row without particular training can even keep themselves tied one to another but at a distance but so there is much debate and I don't think it's so um, um, it's so important to to, to stop in this uh, the uh, the idea naturally was that if you engage the enemy the the best you could do was to be already deployed in battle formation so that to catch him uh, disorganized as we've seen before it happened by you know attacking them in unexpectedly so this was a, a first aim but even to sail from your base from Constantinople or wherever to you know in that formation it's not really probably how it worked so um, whatever but this is obvious in fact and these are kind of weird things you find written but you you can't really give an explanation to because maybe we don't even interpret what, well what was saying by the way language was very mu more concise than it was today so many things especially many words had very semantic sa shades and and also the general way of thinking of and, and synthesizing uh, let's say this concept was very um, you know different from our own way of thinking and always remember that this works were um, were modeled on certain writing styles right so they weren't even made to be actually uh, you know pragmatic stuff things that was really used was generally a red for aristocrats nothing else then who knew the business knew how to do it then there was also this this know-how that was not written down but that was there and was handed out generation to generation of of seamen of sailors of, of admirals that you know everybody kind of knew just like in the army right and and military operations were continuous I mean relatively continuous so there was always a great work around this so these things were not really lost and there was a common sense that at that time was could be found also elsewhere um, so yeah the uh, naturally as we were saying before the, the military um, uh, th there were several types of, of troops, uh, excuse me, of, of uh, ships like the Dromans, the Calandia. The, 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 there was also the Tuldos or Tuldon. There was this sort of baggage train um, of horse transports and supplies uh, ships bringing up to the rear, right? Um, so there were all various adaptations, even from archaeological finds. We don't really know, you know, that there was no standardization as we mean it uh, in modern terms so every ship could be really different another very important part of naval warfare was signaling it was about signaling communication etc now we know that the byzantines just like other modern navies used um, a set of uh, of, uh, sh of flags that uh, different colors and size that were used for transmit very complex uh, signaling um, interestingly enough, as we're recalling before, in Leo the Sixth uh, treatise, there is no uh, evidence of signaling by mirror or by smoke, but we can imagine that they were used as well. Actually, flags, especially at shorter range, are kind of more effective. Smoke is not that you can't signal so much, also especially at sea, you know, it truly depends on what you can accomplish um, in open uh, waters with wind, etc. So. Uh, naturally sailors and, and fleets as well ships as well were trained to practice this uh, signaling system so that obviously and and we know that um, you know some uh, orders some messages were very simple other ones were actually more complex they entailed you know the the, the various maneuvers of the various squadrons etc with several numbers so this was a complex system about which we don't really know much aside from the fact that it existed because Leo um, expresses it uh, quite um, quite uh, openly there are some uh, you know uh, strange aspects of the story like that um, that that there was kind of black flags that is not really the best color you can use at 
at sea, especially if you have like dark blue background of sky and sea, especially in poor weather. So uh, you would think of bright colors, like you know, with red, yellow, and stuff like that. But th this, this is once again, it's already enough that <laughs> we have sources talking about these things in the first place, right? So it's not really, uh, uh, really strange, but. Um, this definitely helped maneuvering. It was essential during during battles, especially where you know a, a freaking big mass of things happen. Especially um, uh, uh, audio uh, messages weren't really functioning that much because, first of all, at the distance, with also with the wind noise and so on, it's not very easy. So, not only it, it's you, what you count on is visibility. But even think of battle. If you know smoke and fire is involved, etc., you know uh, visibility is probably not r really the best thing. Everything is messed up. By the way, we can't imagine of the, uh, ships having some kind of degree of, um, you know, some ways of recognizing each other. But it was still kind of complicated, especially in larger battles. Where well, in larger battles, naturally maneuvering was reduced, probably, you know, to uh, in, in overall to considering that the major maneuvers were about pre-ordered that you you know the larger your troops are in general um, and the larger your your fleet is in general and and the simplest the, the plans are so you don't have a big deal to signal but still at a small uh, units tactics there is something you can communicate to this ship or the other so it's perfectly uh, fine let's say to, to think of this so as we were saying before, when you when these fleets approach battle, what was vital? So let's go. Let's get to the combat proper. What was vital to assemble, to approach an enemy fleet? Uh, information, right? So, and to remain information. This is also particularly important. So one of the tricks, renownedly, was tying the ships. Hmm? Um, the uh, the idea is obvious. Naturally, tight ships are not so easily maneuverable. There are also some problems uh, concerning think about the oars and think about the currents moving. So it's kind of also risky in some ways. But sometimes it's better than uh, being scattered. That can happen quite easily, especially in those on these conditions uh, as well. Um, and the idea is that every ship has to give support to each other during the fight. So you don't want to um, to find one of the ships isolated to form gaps that the enemy can, can exploit and obviously tactics revolved even around this I mean trying to to break the enemy the enemy formation the Byzantine disaster of 655 at the Battle of the Masts happened exactly because they had not brought their fleet into formation uh, during the battle so uh, the the Emperor Constance II barely escaped uh, uh, from that alive, and the um, in, in 904 uh, uh, a Byzantine admiral had to break off his attack uh, on the fleet of Leo of Tripoli because he had not been able to draw up in a counter formation mm -hmm. uh, uh, his own fleet. So. Yeah, and and they had to. Uh, interestingly enough, Leo of Tripoli went on to sack on Thessalonica, so that was a pretty heavy blow. So you realize even, you know, what what a defeat at sea could do at that point, uh, exposing uh, the second most important city of the empire. Uh, the opposite occurred uh, in uh, 956 or uh, 57 with. Uh, well, Basil Examilitas, that was the strategos of the Kiburayotai, uh, Bo instead uh, beat back a, a fleet from Tarsus, and larger than his own, because he had managed to form his own fleet into a counter formation before engagement. Right. So, uh, just like on land, the classical battle tactics uh, was about dis disorganizing the enemy's formation. Um, and um, and this could be achieved also with uh, some tricks. Uh, one was feigned flight, right? So just like on land, and and however this is pretty complicated, um, both on on uh, at sea and on land 
because naturally the enemy is gonna press on and while you retreat naturally you I mean if you want to do it quickly you there is risk to disrupt your own formation so the uh, in order to do that it obviously at, at sea the, the faint flights are, uh, are usually carried out for, for on land especially for luring the enemy into an ambush uh, I, my opinion is that at sea this was kind of a more staged thing when y you make the enemy retreat and you make uh, the same thing actually but in a more uh, let's say probably in a, in a less uh, predictable manner that is you yeah the enemy you you go after the en the enemy uh, uh, because here we're talking about deployed formations right so it's a bit difficult to lure the enemy very far away at sea by drawing into an ambush uh, yeah you can do it actually but probably uh, surprise is not gonna be so overwhelming even given the, the speeds uh, concerned on land it's all way more dynamic and there are way more you know places to hide etc so yeah let's say probably it was something very similar aside from what I think <laughs> But it was practiced, actually, uh, and the risk naturally was that was someone was was left behind in the process. When you retreat, there is always someone who's not going to make it. We're, we're, we can, by the way, even make a sacrifice to make you retreat uh, by halting the enemy pursuit. So this pursuit, this this happens a lot, actually, in every in every battle where there is even a not just a feint, but actually a real flight, a real route. And this these tactics were not a new, definitely to medieval times. Uh, they were used by the Carthaginians at the Battle of Cape Ignomus in 256 BC. Uh, they would be used once again at the Battle of Gulf of Naples by Roger of Lauria in 1284 uh, against the Angevins. So uh, these were kind of the standards, right? Standard tactics of the time, and naturally you couldn't perform them all the time. You need a, the it it requires an extremely skillful um, commander to do that uh, training training of uh, the same crews and ships because you have to do it together. It's a matter of formation. It's not simply you know, and you have to maintain formation. So the greatest generals, both on sea and on land, now were the ones who could practice this, and it, w it was happening on on land in the same exact fashion. Um, the um the, the so yeah the, there are episodes where where this happened um there is uh, a sense that naturally you can also by luring the enemy you can disorganize him in turn especially if you let him believe that uh, you're fleeing for real right so that he launches itself he he breaks formation well that's the moment of weakest um, uh, state uh, that you can exploit, um, but also a very dangerous situation for you as well, right? Um, and according to Leo the Sixth, the standard formation was the line abreast in a shallow crescent moon semicircle, right, with a flagship at the center of the line uh, in its deep, let's say, so at, at the apex of the uh, the mean circle. And the stronger and larger dromons were instead deployed at the end of the line on the flanks. Mm -hmm. um, this was uh, naturally this gives you an idea uh, that because battle formations were very different from this, um, so this gives you an idea on how actually slower, more machinos this naval and relatively less sophisticated this naval battles really were. So that's why I was saying before that it wasn't quite the same like making a faint flight on land like on sea. I mean conceptually it's the same thing, but the way you effectively carried out it's a bit uh, it's a bit different. And and the idea is that this um, crescent moon. Uh, formation, let's say, let's call it this way, was uh, to uh, conceive to encircle the enemy. So you have the best uh, troops on your uh, on your flanks, and you try to outflank the enemy. Also, in here, like a, 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 s a land battle, but let's say with less reliance in some ways on the 
on the strength of the line in itself that is that is hollow that, that is shallow exactly because you want to absorb evenly the enemy you want to lure the enemy in the center even attacking from the sides with missile troops as if this were because differently from land battles where you have kind of a attacking smashing element at sea you don't have that so basically what you want to do is to lure the enemy in the center which it might, might even occur unintentionally because uh, because of the wind of, of the currents right and to therefore concentrate fire on him while he's in the midst like so uh, that's what you want to do because all you have is the fact at this time only missile uh, ships that's what they are yeah they can spore but you're not gonna annihilate an enemy like that you can spore you can block there is maneuver maneuverability but still the way you assault and attack the ships is chiefly about missile troops, uh, missiles and projectiles, right? And even boarding entailed. So this is way more machinous than a uh, land battle because there is a, a much greater inertia in the wall system, right? And by the way, you're not even sure if, like, think of the wind changing, etc. You know, whether you can have the same moment, uh, momentum at the same time. I mean, it can, that can be based on mor uh, on morale, on land battles, but or impetus, etc. At, at sea, you know, what how much impetus you you have as as an individual sailor doesn't really change uh, the the formation movement, right? It, it can happen. Like if you really uh, strain your arm and you try to, you know, to achieve something like that, but it, for what effect? If you can't even sink the enemy when. Um, in one shot with by ramming you know so um, this is the point the, the reason by the way why ramming wasn't uh, there anymore was naturally that this ships let's repeat it had decreased in size so even if they had wanted to crush against the enemy they didn't have the strength the the inertia to 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 crash into the enemy else right um, and the there, there are other reasons why uh, this um, crescent moon demi circle formation uh, was used is that the flight ship uh, can uh, the, the flagship sorry um, can uh, flee more easily uh, if it's in the um, in, in, in its in the deep of the formation right so that's the idea you know we can't uh, be safe uh, if, if things go wrong etc so the idea is encircling the enemy if you can then definitely the enemy is not gonna stop there and you as you can imagine probably some of the most some of the fiercest fights took place on the on the sides right um, but there were other formations as well uh, one included for instance a straight line um, or several lines of squadrons Mm -hmm. This resembled more uh, the latter, the uh, land battles. I mean, the idea that you have several lines, so you have several ranks and these reserves, this um, gradual effort you can make by sending in several lines of squadrons to revive the fight according to how it's really going and having reserves and, and calculating how to use them. This can be particularly u useful also if you want to if you don't want to commit all your forces at once because you fear them to be annihilated so even uh, I mean always that um, caution that is required not to make the dual uh, fleet sink uh, or, or being captured actually uh, and uh, the squadrons could attack at this point either from the flanks or from the rear once the enemy was engaged in the main formation so the idea is that there is a there's a rank that is involved and then you make the other ones uh, going on their rank this is very ideal uh, it was the objective uh, uh, I mean on their their flanks or it's very ideal and this is how also land battles worked I mean theoretically you always had to outflank the enemy right to attack either on from the flank or from the rear but how were really how many were the, really the chances to to achieve that uh, the enemy is not there just sit you know looking what you're doing and doing nothing the enemy is most likely trying to do the same thing so that's why also this you know kind of single line or semicircle formation are usually the, the most standard because they are the ones who try to 
that, that, that offer the best balance, right? In, a, uh, in an ideal battle, then of course, always think about the geography, think about the, in fact, the, the, the need of making ambushes as, as much as you could. So these complicated maneuvers that could happen even at, you know, several kilometers of distance, um, you know, if you had a natural obstacle, you could hide uh, behind uh, of uh, uh, and, and yeah. Uh, however, that was the classical formation, let's say, and and um, in especially in fact, r in fact, relatively to I I let's say in an ideal battle where you you have nowhere to hide, so when in, uh, the f the formation in depth is usually achievable only when you have s you know an overwhelming um, a numerical superiority, right? When you can engage the enemy, you can uh, uh, you can commit all the enemy forces into the fight, and then you have other troops, uh, other ships you can use to to go around them because they have nothing else to to oppose to you to 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 stop that maneuver to counter that maneuver. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's not really, but. It, the idea is, however, that even a small, uh, just like on land battles, even a small uh, number of ships can be hidden, concealed somewhere if there, there is a natural obstacle, and by attacking the enemy, by the rear, can achieve even uh, as at least uh, psychologically some, some, um, you know, some damage. Um, although it's very different from formations on land, because on formations on land you have, you know, people literally breaking the formation because it's people who make the formation a single, uh, the single rank, right? With the ships it's not like that. With the ships you can't literally run away um, with the same speed, with the same reaction. Uh, the formation doesn't quite melt in the same way it melts with it's all way more machinous, right? So sometimes it's like muscle to muscle, right? It's like iron arm uh, at sea. It's not really like you know this thing of uh, and 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 fleeing can be way more difficult than than in other situations like on on land, right? Um, the reason for which uh, it was uh, definitely very important to resort to to ambushes because that was sometimes the only way you had to 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 really even have the possibility of of seizing the wall the the, the enemy fleet all at once because you could cut their uh, escape routes right it, it could be relatively easier than you could at the same time uh an escaping um a ship at that point is keeping to to hurl missiles at you which is something we will see now. They could, you know, they could even run out of ammo because th that was also very valuable um, asset to to use. But um, still, things are relatively different from land battles. Um, not really, especially at at a small unit tactics. What uh, in in on the large, um, you know, at the larger uh, on a larger scale, they're kind of they become increasingly more similar, right? In any case, the crescent moon line abreast formation was the, let's say, standard formation, the one normally used, uh, etc. Uh, evidence goes uh, for it goes back to antiquity. Uh, it remained a standard battle formation until actually the the days of uh, the, the the end of the days of galley warfare into the Mediterranean, right? Um, so as we were saying before, the objective was to overwhelm the ends of the enemy line so that you could surround uh, the enemy and to escape uh, to to cut their uh, to cut off their escape uh, to attack them at least where they were more vulnerable on the flanks because by the way um, the prows were reinforced there were some time castles on there because they were the side that which the ship was uh, expected to engage um, just like land formations, right? Uh, an attack on a flag attacks on a side that is usually not uh, prepared to fight. But at the same time, uh, this, the flank, as we know, with crossing the T, let's say, <laughs> um, even though that's something more specific, uh, obviously if you attack with a prow uh, perpendicularly an enemy ship, well, you, from, from the flank there is 
kind of more space for for missile um, missiles and projectiles to hit your your prow, right? So that's not really the best thing um, to do because you're usually passively exposed. This this was mostly evident, especially with the development of artillery, um, but um, this wasn't excessively similar, right? Given that you know even the galleys were equipped in a fashion that could be. Uh, but vital is that on the, on the flanks you had you you had the oars as well, so you needed them. You, the, the prow could could uh, the enemy prow could smash it with his pores into it, to them into the oars and blocking your your mobility. So all things that get balanced out a little bit, at least in favor of uh, chiefly in favor of of the flank is more able to throw things at you and. Um, it's not easy to gain momentum even during a fight when the men are exhausted, they're they're stressed out, and, and all this stuff. Um, and the uh, this is all evidence that Leo the Sixth uh, presents. Um, and there is, however, some other stuff he says that probably he took either from. Um, uh, in, in great part, uh, from Syrianos ma Magistras and Maurice, uh, the Sauda Maurice, um, that is um, the um, the the use of the crescent formation for a fighting retreat, right? And the uh, the idea is. Uh, you know there are some advantages theoretically that is the thing that yeah at least you maintain formation right so that there is not risk that an isolated ship remains uh, left behind however back in water is something particularly complicated I mean yeah you can't you could theoretically turn the ship but if you are deployed in formation usually that's extremely complicated you have to make all the ships doing it at once and then retreating them all at once. Only in the meanwhile exposing your flanks and sides and rear to the enemy. It's very complicated. Uh, back in water, therefore, I that that would be the only uh, you know way you could do you could do it practically, uh, even if it's something terrible as we see. Because first of all, it, everything gets way more difficult to maneuver. You go much slower because the ship is not designed to go backwards, at least as as fast as it can go forward. Um, secondly, <laughs> there is a, a big problem because you can't operate the, r the rudder at that point. That's a freaking problem. So this idea of backing water, yeah, it's pretty weird, and that it's, it's one of those things you're reading this treatise and said, "What, what the hell?" Once again, <laughs> and um, and by the way, even maintaining formation in that case is pretty pretty complicated. Um, and disengaging an enemy in that fashion is, you know, kind of mad. I mean, it's way better to kind of retreat, as we were saying before, with the feigned flight, by the way, that is contemplated even by Leo VI as a tactics, that is scattering your ships. That That's way better, because everybody runs. Yeah, there is someone left behind caught by the enemy, but at the same time, uh, the, the bulk of the of the, the ship, maybe the ships can, can go away, and and then hoping in in an, uh, in making an ambush succeed if you have hidden so uh, hidden other ships out there to attack an exhausted enemy or an enemy that has broken formation to go after you because consider also this that if you backwater for the sake of maintaining formation uh, well the enemy is not breaking his own so you're you're still putting yourself in a lot of trouble and what for uh, it's it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so the, the, the all the enemy would have had to do at that time was simply keeping to press onto the retreating ships back in water until their crews were exhausted. By the way, because the enemy is going faster than you, so just imagine rowing backwards and and the enemy's rowing, uh, you know, forward against you. Yeah, it's total madness and. Uh, and and that's one of those uh, writing styles uh, tricks probably because to see it is in a way or another says something similar, but it it was uh, in a completely different um, 
uh, context and and in covering the retreat of other allies, and uh, so it wasn't really anything like that. And a similar tactic of of um, you know backing water was also po- um, um, carried out in uh, uh, eight. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, eight, uh, in 87 BC, um, by the Rhodian fleet, because he backed water, however, to retreat towards the arbor of Rhodes, so where you are consistently defended. Well, then, yes, but <laughs> definitely not in open water. So here is probably Leo VI taking these examples um, and um, kind of reinserting them in the treatise and saying, okay, this will work, but he didn't specify that maybe these two examples were into very different con- uh, you know, situations. One, you know, essentially getting sacrificed to, to let your allies escape. And the second, retreating to, to a nearby harbor, friendly harbor, where you can even, you know, fence off probably the, the, the enemy ships away. So that's... That's really uh, a very different thing. And, and this tells you how ideal sometimes the contents of these treatises are, right? Um, there is also another thing that Leo says that was, um, this writes especially explicitly that if you want to use uh, the uh, siphonis, so the siphon for, for using liquid fire, um, you have to be deployed in, in a straight line, right? So a normal line, without the shallow center, right? So, um, so this is kind of um, strange uh, as well, because the idea is, first of all, wh- what's really the difference with a crescent formation? Well, I mean, what what is that using... Uh, Greek fire in this sense is, is going to entail, right? I don't really see the point. Um, it's um, it's possible that um, this idea was kind of drawn partially from Syrianos Magistrus that um, that actually um, flips the uh, the the crescent. Uh, because the idea at that point was having the uh, the bulk of the force on the center to break the enemy line in two, if I understood correctly. So the idea was that Greek fire would have been used a very close range to basically attack into the uh, to go straight into the enemy sh- uh, f- into the middle of the enemy formation, um, and um, and therefore trying to break them in the middle. But still, this is a kind of more of a arrow formation, not really a line formation, and and that is particularly interesting because um, you you basically have you split the 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 enemy formation in two, and and then you can try in this sense to kind of encircle them from still from the, the, considering the two halves now are they, they have at least two. If we want to compensate the fact that the center is broken, to to wheel a little bit, so exposing their flank uh, uh, towards your f- uh, your sides, all right. So, but still, it, 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 what Leo VI says in this context doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, at least apparently, right? Um, the um, so looking once again at the broader tactics that were employed, we said there was no ship killing weapon, right? Uh, just the the liquid fire that in in this last example we we have seen that could be used kind of like a ram, like you go straight into the enemies um, and you uh, unleash liquid fire. By the way, with all the risks that there are, if you know if you're particularly lucky that wind is favorable, etc. But you still have to break to the formations. You you have to at least to pass these ships behind or maybe attack the, the enemy flagship directly, who knows. By the way, risking in, in, in the meanwhile to be encircled because and, and you're under very heavy fire because if the enemy has um, a, a demi crescent formation as well, if you really want to go straight into the center like that, you have to pass basically uh, in, into cross fire, I mean into uh, fire coming from all directions. 
and fill out fire basically so it, it, it's really a risky thing and that's why the crescent is it was probably the best uh, formation ever so from any other um, idea um, so in general really uh, w what is true of all galley warfare is that what really proved itself decisive were maneuvers I mean th there's no other way I mean if you can't knock out the enemy ships and they have the same um, technology the same weapons etc all you can do at that point is to hope for a uh, kind of disorder caused by some uh, particular maneuver that we think could be flank attack rear attack uh, coming from ambushes or feint flights that are same thing I mean involving still faint retreat at that point um, so everything really revolved around this naturally most of the battles would be won um, I mean it, it's really rare telling the truth in all military history to find a type of battle that is effectively replicated all over and over again like the ideal battle of two demi crescent formations as far as we know it, first of all it's very difficult to to study battles at this time because there are no tactical details uh, very often but however even from those you realize that most of the times battles were won for something that went f far straight from from doctrine proper I mean from having used this kind of manualistic formation um, and and therefore things could really change for many other factors it, it's always like that during a campaign it's not you know the battle is the result of something enormously more complicated that happens at a strategical level and it can go seriously uh, differently from what you have previewed you have foreseen so uh, even the battle in itself shouldn't be taken as the uh, I mean the big battle the ideal battle let's say between two entire fleets as the primary tactical reality of this naval warfare at the time it, it was probably way more um, you know uh, simpler sometimes uh, but also smaller in terms of number of ships engaged um, and so on Talking about larger battles, uh, the uh, you, what would normally happen, uh, as, as we said before, is was holding formation at all costs, getting all together against the enemy, and then starting this exo exhausting phase of um, exchange of projectiles. You know, missiles were designed to degrade uh, both the enemy's manpower and the structures of the ships. Uh, in part, chiefly, chiefly actually uh, manpower, I believe, because of of the reasons we have explained before, and the ultimate objective was boarding in a way or in another. Probably boarding wasn't even so excessively uh, frequent, uh, given I mean at least in relation to the number of ships effectively caught. Probably most of the ships would simply surrender during the fight, um, and that's normally how how really it happens boarding requires a lot of a lot of guts a lot of moral resources and uh you know i know it looks spectacular in movies but probably didn't happen quite frequently everywhere we know that galley warfare was characterized by boarding consistently but still um in order to board an enemy ship you have even to have some specific Ratio. I mean, even staying on your own ship is, uh, uh, it has this, you know, general advantage, even for preventing the enemy from boarding as well. It's like charging to the bayonet. It, it's not something very, very, very frequent, but when it happens, it's because there is an overwhelming gap in the, um, in the fighters uh, to respective opponents' morale. That very often, in fact, in that case, is enough to, uh, not even reaching the the clash but simply making the guys who were attacked surrendering because they say okay we surrender if these guys have the guts now after having fought now for hours to to and the, the resources the, the strengths etc to the coordination to attack us 
and we are exhausted, well, we simply surrender. We don't even put up a fight, right? Um, and naturally, uh, in all this, missile exchange at distance would go on over and over and over. And this also has a huge impact on the psychological resources of the crews, of the Marines, because um, that is uh, that is hard to bear, and um, in a lot of uh, a lot of projectiles, where uh, there is a list of of, of material, we we'll perhaps read later, of all the um, projectiles that were mounted on during expeditions. There were so many, but from the numbers and the ratios, uh, you realize how certain, especially arrow fire, was was constant, probably at least in the initial phases where. Uh, supplies were 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 out there, and and arrows were out there. I mean, even in land battles, you know that, especially in this Byzantine world, and against the Arabs, etc., were were pretty extensively used. Um, the um, talking about liquid fire, uh, there weren't just the siphonis uh, for for. Uh, Launching it on the enemy, on the enemy ships. Sometimes they they could uh, agree, um, the the liquid fire could be hurled by catapult, uh, preferably in pottery jars that are perfect because they're kind of good. They uh, to isolate temperature, but they break at impact, so they inflame, etc. Other times there were certain caltrops with some a uh, tow wrap around them uh, and soaked into liquid fire that is also very good because you have this internal heavy part uh, structure that weights and therefore you can uh, you know launch more uh, effectively but surrounded by this uh, flame flamed uh, 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 cloth so um, could be uh, very good as well and and the caltrop by the way is also something can uh, that that makes it more difficult to like to stop the fire because it's oh, so irregular. By the way, you can't even get wounded to try to, 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 I don't know, step in on it during something like that. So it was a very clever measure. By the way, uh, naturally, much of 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 this uh, liquid fire could be uh, aimed, at, especially at at sails, at the cord dash, etc that sets on fire pretty easily. So the caltrop is also capable of of cutting in through it. Differently from pottery jars that, yeah, that they're not spiked, and they they can't cut into, to the sails, for instance. Of course, also caltrops weren't launched at a terrific speed, but you know, still they could make some damage, perhaps on the, on the that side as well. And unfortunately enough, I even put an image in here that there are surviving uh, examples of caltrops, and of uh, pottery jars and they were used for, for this reason I, I think they are more recent right you know th these were stuff the missiles were used even much later in time uh, until firearms uh, appeared basically so yeah and we know something about that and once again it was pretty standard all over Mediterranean warfare and not only and the and then there were way more uh, average uh, missiles like ordinary caltrops first of all that were used by the way uh, to be thrown on the enemy decks even to to hamper movement this was done frequently arrows um, which shot either by bows or catapults uh, rocks rocks were used also pretty extensively if you you know, if you look at Viking warfare of the same time uh, going around in ninth century, tenth century, you know, the world the tactics were basically the same. I mean, that the the whole thing started with this rain of arrows and rocks, etc. Uh, pretty similar. And naturally, it was a kind of a more primitive, uh, uh, you know, way primitive tactic and means, etc. But yeah, then there were a smaller darts or arrows or balls known as flies or mice 
they were shot by catapults uh, that were kind of more compact they had this kind of uh, it's like the the crossbows bolts fundamentally you know that they're the heaviest ones that there are various types and we have interestingly enough a list of projectiles from the Cretan expedition of 949 that counts 10,000 caltrops 50 bows 10,000 arrows 20 handheld bow uh, balliste uh, and 200 mice in 100 javelins per dromon. Now this is impressive, like 10,000 caltrops and 10,000 arrows per dromon. And you see this kind of heavier, um, uh, this kind of heavier uh, bullets like mice and javelins. Interestingly enough, the bows are 50, right? So you have basically 200 uh, arrows per bow, uh, con conceptually at least. And it's not a few. Actually, it's a lot. It's a lot of, of material, even to produce it. I mean, arrows do cost a lot. So this tells you even about their effectiveness and how the whole thing was primarily directed at killing the enemy. I mean, killing the enemy crews. And, and arguably, this was done probably in a very intense way. Like, if, if, even if you see and how military uh, tactics evolved, even on land, you realize that there was a sort of s saturation or supp a slash suppression fire uh, to be thrown all in one shot. That was the best thing to do. So, throwing all this stuff like hell, naturally, this is, uh, you know, the equipment for, for an entire expedition. So, you can imagine that it would be several s separate chances to to uh, to exhaust this missile, these projectiles, this ammo, but uh, still I think that during battles the, the thing was inflicting, I mean having a, a, a very big volume of fire concentrated in a in a very few amount of time, right, so that you could really exhaust the enemy immediately if you could and disorganize them immediately so that uh, you know, I, I mean if you throw 100 arrows in, 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 in one minute it's definitely gonna do much more harm um, uh, even psychologically speaking uh, not just physically d uh, than uh, 100 arrows in, 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 in 10 minutes right so it's it's important to do it immediately um, that's also something you can't see from linear tactics etc yeah the same amount of projectiles but thrown in uh, all together instead than in even among in poses this is important you know um then 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 shot gradually can have this major impact in making the enemy flee or causing uh, even physically at the moment more damage more confusion more chaos than the same amount of uh, of of bolts shot uh, like one at a time right um, and it's particularly interesting uh, that we were telling even about rocks before that, by the way, could be evidently found even along the shore when the other bullets were exhausted, is that in 822 the fleet of Thomas the Slab opened its engagement with the Imperial fleet in the Golden Horde by hurling rocks. So this was Thomas the Slab, but still um, this was used in Byzantine armies as well. So using rocks Um, the there, there are uh, other uh, uh, there is other advice concerning the fact of uh, not shooting at enemies that are protected by shields, right? Um, and, and that therefore, th I mean, save your arm, spare your ammo if you can. So throw a lot of them against the enemy, but always kind of consider you know what effect they can they can do, right? Um, and the mm, that there is this um, other quoting here that says that basically the, the, the Muslims of Chilicia, by the way, so also pretty close to the empire, were well trained in naval warfare and they covered their shields until an enemy had exhausted his missiles before engaging. Now this is particularly important because it tells you that, you know, uh, that was the, the measure, you know, stay covered until the enemy is done with you. Now, the, there is a problem into this, because while 
you you're covering yourself with your shield still the 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 ship can be targeted the caltrops can do damage uh, things can be set on fire so even just covered with the shields uh, entails some passivity even what about your own archers you know whether doing they're just waiting so this is very theoretical but it still tells us that even being protected by shields was very effective given the type of missile involved um, yeah and 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 this source by the way states also that uh, battles were not winning mi in the missile phases but they could influence the outcome and that it was mostly hand-to-hand -hand combat to decide it to decide it well this is I'm not, I'm not I don't I really disagree with this I believe that the major damage was done uh, into uh, at a distance um, but this is just like uh, I don't have evidence to support this let's say that uh, I think after a very long exchange of missiles of, of this uh, of that entity at that distance well uh, at least in terms of physical resources, much has been consumed during that time, even uh, psychological ones, being constantly under fire and being this situation in which you have to protect yourself, well, it takes a lot of nerves and a lot of training, etc. So it really depends. It also obviously depends on, on the quality of your marines. They are the ones that are going to be engaged into hand-to-hand -hand combat, but generally speaking, I think that... Um, missile warfare at least missile um, pr um weapons were the ones that normally even in not really in 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 every situation i mean even hand to hand combat uh, to get to uh, to it it's pretty rare i mean uh, there would be always the chance to uh, to assault the enemy to board the enemy sometimes it was just hitting at distance so all consider even outside the big battle probably was still the missile weapon that made the difference in some way or at least it caused the the, the highest number of losses consider also this that very frequently into medieval warfare but usually when crossbow comes in but, uh, you know the, uh, the, the, the missile doesn't take into account who you are it just hits you so, so um, some of the most horrendous wounds uh, were caused by missile uh, weapons, etc. So, well, whatever. Um, the and towards the final phase of the battle, ships would naturally grapple, and um, at this point, the, uh, the 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 idea was basically attacking. Uh, I mean, it was one ship versus one, so even the crew of one against the other. Uh, or at least this is how it was ideally intended, right? And the boarding operation, as we said before, was probably very much thought, calibrated. It's obvious that if you have the best marines and you want to close in as quickly as possible to take the enemy out, the boarding is all you're gonna look forward to. And you're, but um, in in sea at sea, it's not so easy. The enemy can flee, etc. So. The the world fight was probably something way more staged, and the the individual uh, you know uh, decisions, especially the single ships, were probably very much heterogeneous. Uh, and and still, boarding is something you don't do lightheartedly. You need a lot of guts, a lot of 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 of, of, of strength, right? And at that point, my my idea is that, in fact, the the fight ha is already decided most of the time so if, if you have enough uh, if there is enough let's say a difference in potential for, for one crew deciding to board another right um, and probably missile weapons have done most of the work at that point right? and uh, the the ships were uh, you know, captured with iron rods and grappling hooks at both hands, were used to grapple them and uh, so that and couple it so that they the ship and coupled the the ship so that it could not escape. And uh, there was this 
countermeasure from the uh, boarded ship that, that was trying to keep the enemy ship at distance using um, long poles. They were very long, actually. This, they have the same name of laxes, cavalry, long cavalry laxes like the Aconte or the Contaria, etc. And um, some of them are said to be uh, to have been in bronze, but it's quite unlikely because it's true that bronze doesn't rust, so it's very good for for uh, for maritime um, instruments, etc., and even artillery later. But uh, you know. It, it, it can be easily chopped in the middle and it's not a very good material to, to do it. it. By the way, it's very heavy as well, uh, renowingly, and, and therefore it can even be easily broken if it's a pole with, with, with an iron axe, so uh, it seemingly it's not the case. And Leo VI insists on the fact that this um, uh, measure uh, was keeping the enemy ship destined to prevent boarding with poles um, was had to be uh, you know you know he he warns us that that it, it was a too risky uh, opera i mean it was not always advantageous at least in that it, it required uh, therefore we think uh, a lot of practice right so uh, because it, it effectively takes a lot of cooperation especially if you're under fire, you need this to, to man these poles while you're under arrow fire, etc. And, and you have to balance out all the ship's weight, even against the the oarman uh, strength, the wind strength, and all what can intervene at that point. So it required a lot of um, synergy, a lot of strength, definitely as well from, from the crew, and, and it was not always successful, even. And um, at that, at, uh, once the the enemy ship was uh, taken, uh, you know, a contact with your own, then you could assault. You could board it, and uh, and that's well the, the Marines, that is the fully armed soldiers, came into play. So they would um, the um, uh, before during the missile phase, probably they stationed on those parts of the decks that. Uh, uh, they that, that could preserve them best from the enemy fire. The, those were the guys probably who were most covered by the shields that uh, the, the sources talked about uh, before. Um, the uh, so those were the troops that you wanted to preserve the most. That's why uh, probably also they could re reverse the tide sometimes if they had not suffered enough losses. So that only much of you know the boarding definitely depended on them. Um, and the uh, and, and at this point they they could uh, they had probably they were equipped with several weapons that were pretty much useful for naturally hand to hand combat even for smashing others marines uh, armor so there were even certain naval instruments that are like uh, cranes or other stuff that, that can are really in order are blunt weapons sometimes or piercing weapons so they are uh, anti-armor weapons like this is typical of many uh, sh uh, naval uh, uh, equipments or sometimes even naval tools as we were saying before not literally just weapons uh, the ideal is that uh, at least has uh, Leo the sixth uh, suggested that uh, liquid fire had to be thrown onto the enemy deck um, and the but it, it's pretty uh, you know, and and then you could you could try rocks or iron weights at them, uh, and all this stuff. Uh, however, it, it sounds pretty strange. I mean, if you really want to, first of all, liquid fire. We've seen how dangerous it is, especially when you're a close contact with the enemy. You're gonna trying to set on fire. First of all, and then why would you reverse, uh, you know, uh, you know, rocks and other, you know iron weights and other obstacles on the deck that you have yourself to uh, to attack right it, it's pretty uh, useless you want to have space and a free way in order to if you have an advantage at least uh, and you expect to 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 win the the, the fight uh, on, uh, against the enemy uh, crew well yeah and uh, you know throwing fire on the ship it's best when you want to sink it <laughs> very simply 
and sometimes ships would even you know if they got pretty close to the coast they would try to kind of smash each other's you know against the rocks or something like that. if they could it's not very easy telling you the truth but it can uh, you can even blocking the enemy ship can can be achieved theoretically with that but it's way easier to kind of harpoon it uh, to keep it stuck to your side then there are a bunch of other what the hell moments from Leo the uh treatise uh, one basically suggests once the you have flanked the enemy ship to uh, take away uh, the oars from the oar ports and to, st and to um, insert pikes into the uh, into the holes so that you can basically uh, trust the enemy uh, uh, you know crews with that and the idea is what <laughs> like uh, first of all it, you know, taking away an oar is pretty complicated, uh, at least, uh, and it can be even dangerous uh, to do it, especially in such tremendously uh, delicate uh, moments like, like a combat. Secondly, what can you really do with a pike used at the place of oars? I mean, I don't want really to dismiss uh, this as just ah, it's it's ridiculous, etc. But you have to think realistically of what could be achieved that couldn't be achieved with missile weapons or with with boarding. Right, at that point especially when you're so close uh, contact with the enemy so this is the probably most important thing the other thing is um, you know pikes you know you can break them pretty easily they're very difficult to maneuver in the first place uh, and especially by inserting them in their ore ports you know that's not the best way uh, you can use them like you know think about all the 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 leverage and the, the, uh, how do you use that exactly how can you see what you're hitting or how can you impress the force or can how can it be of use at that point uh, unless maybe this wasn't referred to hit the oarmen from the other side but could be but um it's pretty it's, you know, it's pretty weird the other one is uh, is even um, is, is similar actually because it, it says to uh, it's just to hold the enemy uh, the ship's hull from the lower or bank with certain pikes that were used for this specific purpose and probably in here. Uh, this is actually, I think we get it from the paraphrases of Nicephorus Uranus. Um, and I don't know where they could have get gotten this thing from, but the idea is, uh, I mean, pr probably he was, uh, the elder was getting it from Leo the Sixth thing of the pikes in, into the ore ports for hitting the enemy crews. So maybe Nicephorus was simply saying, okay, well, as much as he could pierce the enemy, Crews it could pierce the enemy hull. Now this is even worse because pikes are not really meant to break into the hulls. That by the way get immediately kind of very, uh, very curvy um, uh, underneath the 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 the, the ship's um, the ship's uh, hull uh, below sea water. By the way, the you know the, this galley's head. A very short uh, drought, so uh, you know they they weren't really you know and and the whole thing sounds to very mechanism thinking about the angle of approach and even during the battle with movement and all the mass you know it's not really it it's not really the case. So um, more or less, this is what I wanted to say. Um, this is. This is all very interesting, and it's a pity that we really know so uh, so few about this. Uh, I would like to say that I got most of this information from pages uh, 490, uh, actually 83, sorry, and 406 uh, of um, Brill's publishing The Age of the Droman. Byzantine Navy circa 500 to 1204 that takes into consideration in this chapter exactly the, the times of the Macedonian um, fleet um, and um, by by John H. Pryor and Elizabeth M. Jeffries. So if you're interested to look at this book, it's tremendous, it's very beautiful. There are many books actually of the 
uh, about this. This is very complete. It's very long as well. It's like 800 pages. It talks about several different aspects of Galilee warfare and uh, throughout all Byzantine history, I, I mean until at least the 13th century, so the Fourth Crusade. But there are many other books that you can uh, read about general uh, Galilee warfare. One of my favorites for the introduction is The Age of Galilee, Mediterranean Ord Vessels since pre-classical times, editor Robert Gardiner. Um, and uh, consultant editor here, Professor John Morrison. That's pretty good. That's also a lot of stuff. Tells you from, in this case, from the ancient, from from all, uh, you know, the age of Galilee's proper. So, from ancient times to to the modern, uh, to the contemporary ones, uh, almost. Well, no, modern ones, and uh, it's very interesting. So, I definitely advise you. And, and novel history is very fascinating. It tells you a lot, even about strictly non-novel stuff about warfare in general. And, and we will be keep talking about this uh, sometime soon, more in detail, looking even at kind of more more specific times and spaces. Um, and for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.